all rise. You may be seated. At this time, the court once again calls the case of State of Wisconsin v. Stephen Avery, case 05-CF-381. Would the parties state their appearances for the record? Is the sound system not on? Nope, it's not on at all. No. Okay, it's on now. Terrific, Mr. Kratz. Appearances for the state. Your Honour, the state appears by Calumet County District Attorney Ken Kratz, appearing as Special Prosecutor. Also appearing in this case is Mr. Fallon, Assistant Attorney General, and Mr. Gunn, Assistant District Attorney from Milwaukee County. Good morning, Your Honour. Attorney Jerome Buting and Attorney Dean Strain appearing with Mr. Avery, who is present. All right, Mr. Kratz, are you going to call your next witness? I don't know if this is working, Judge. Does that help at all? Check the plug under the desk. That is probably going to be a little loud. But the state calls Nicole Sturm, Judge. If you would raise your right hand, please state your full name and spell your last name, please. Nicole Sturm, S. T-U-R-M. Good morning, Miss Sturm. Thank you for coming this morning. Let me first ask you if you know a woman by the name of Pam Sturm? Yes. Who is Pam? She is my mother. And were you with Pam on the morning hours of November 5th of 2005? Yes, I was. Would you tell the jury where you went that morning, please? We first went to Teresa's house to enter the search, to become volunteers for the search. All right. Thereafter, Miss Sturm, did you accompany your mother to a property which is known as the Avery Auto Salvage Yard? Yes, I did. And after arriving at that scene, we understand from your mother that you received, you and she, that is, received permission to search for the vehicle on that property. Is that correct? Yes. We received permission from Errol Avery. Tell the jury, as best you can remember, what efforts you made to search for Teresa's car that morning. We started out heading towards the south south of the auto salvage yard. We went through looking inside vehicles, looking for anything that would that could distinguish anything to do with Teresa, whether it be Teresa herself or any articles that would be as to her. Sometime just before 10.30 that morning, I understand you found something, is that right? Yes. My mom indicated that she found a RAV4 Toyota vehicle that didn't exactly match the description, the search form that we had, but looked very similar. It was distinguishing because it was covered up with auto salvage materials as well as branches. So she definitely called me over and I went running. All right. When you ran toward your mother's location, can you tell the jury what you saw, please? I saw a bluish green rav with salvage parts up against it and branches over the top and on other areas. Definitely a vehicle that looked li like someone was trying to hide. Now, there is an exhibit which has been marked in this case and received as exhibit number 31. I direct your attention to the large screen here to your right and ask if that, in fact, is the vehicle that you saw that morning. Yes, that is the vehicle. Now, your mother explained. Objection. Counsel is leading the witness by saying, your mother did this, your mother did that. She should be asked open-ended questions and let the witness explain what she saw and what she did. I will sustain the objection to the form of the question. That's fine, Judge. 
Ms. Durham, who took the photographs of these vehicles? I took the photographs. And other than taking the photographs, can you tell the jury what else you did around that vehicle? With a tissue, I checked four doors to see if any of the doors were open. They were all locked. So none of the four doors were open. I also used my cell phone to call the sheriff's office. Can you describe this tissue a little bit better? Sure. Because it was cold November day, I brought tons of tissues with me because my nose was running and whatnot. I had clean tissues within my pockets. My mom stated, please use, I don't want to disturb anything, so please use your shirt sleeve or whatever you have to avoid touching the vehicle. I thought I better that I had a clean tissue in my pocket, so I used that. I did check all four doors to see if anything was open. They were all locked. Miss Durham, you did have occasion to look inside of this, correct? Yes, I did look in at every angle and saw a wild cherry Pepsi in the front and a bottle of Aquafina, but I didn't see Teresa or anything that I could identify that it was definitely Teresa's vehicle at that point. Could you describe the lighting conditions inside of the vehicle, please? Well, the area that the vehicle is in, you can see that there are trees and whatnot. It was a rather cloudy day. It was definitely dark. You couldn't visibly see. We did not have flashlights to be able to intricately look at details within the vehicle. Did you check for the vehicle identification number? Yes, I did look. I didn't know exactly where they were located, so I did, it, I did take a little while to locate the VIN number. But we did find the VIN number on the driver's side, near the windshield. It was a black interior and black dashboard, but also the metal that the VIN number was on was black metal. So as well, it was a little difficult to actually read the VIN number, as well as the fact that I am a little bit short. So I had to try to reach over the top of the vehicle to read the VIN number without touching the vehicle or actually touching or rubbing up against the vehicle. After the telephone call was made to law enforcement authorities, where did you go? I stayed right near my mom, right near the vehicle. And after, after law enforcement was contacted, we moved a little bit away from the vehicle. We kept our eyes on the vehicle at all times, just to make sure that no one else was coming. We didn't want to draw attention to ourselves in case someone would come after us. But we did find the vehicle. Was there any fixed object or any place that you were standing while you waited for law enforcement to arrive? We were near a car crusher, the machinery that car crushes cars in the salvage yard. While you were waiting for law enforcement, did any individuals approach that vehicle? No, no one was near the vehicle. How long was it before law enforcement arrived, if you can remember? I would say approximately 20 minutes at the most. Now, after law enforcement arrival, can you tell us what you did, please? When law enforcement arrived, we pointed to where the vehicle was and we stayed on the scene to be able to give statements. When law enforcement arrived, where were you looking? And what were you doing? We stayed right near the car crusher area. We were waiting for the actual identification that it was Teresa's vehicle. And from then to come back and identify it was Teresa's vehicle because at that point in time, we still were unaware if it was her vehicle or not. When law enforcement arrived, were you also watching the vehicle? Yes, we kept our eyes on the vehicle all the time. 
Did anybody enter the vehicle? No. No one did, entered the vehicle. Did anybody touch the vehicle that you saw? No one touched the vehicle. Ms. Durham, did you know the difference between the Manitowoc County Sheriff's deputies and the Calumet County Sheriff's deputies? Yes, they did identify themselves with their names and which department they were from. Do you know which department was the first to arrive on the scene? The first to arrive on the scene was Manitowoc County. However, they had an officer that stood near the vehicle and did not touch the vehicle. He did not really approach the vehicle. He just stood guard to make sure it was not touched until Calumet County did arrive. About how long after Manitowoc's arrival did Calumet arrive? Just a few minutes. They were right behind. After the Calumet County officers arrived, did you continue to watch the vehicle? Yes, we did. Once again, Ms. Durham, did anybody either approach, touch the vehicle, or enter the vehicle while you were there? No one touched the vehicle or entered the vehicle while we were there. How long were you there before you actually left that scene? We were there until like noon or 12.30ish before we left the scene. So two hours or two and a half hours. In that two hours that you were there or two and a half hours that you were there, that entire time, did you see anybody enter or touch that vehicle? No. No one entered or touched that vehicle. Miss Durham, you mentioned that you had checked the four doors. What four doors are you talking about? The driver's side, front and passenger doors, and the actual passenger front and back. All four were locked? All four were locked. Were you asked to give a, either a verbal or a written statement to law enforcement that day? Yes, I gave a written statement to law enforcement. Did you tell law enforcement that you checked the doors and they were locked? Yes, and I indicated that I did use a tissue, that I didn't use my bare hands to check the doors. I believe that's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Buting. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Now, you talked about when you first arrived that you began looking through some vehicles before your mom discovered this SUV. Is that right? That's correct. And in fact, before you did that, were you there when she asked permission or did you ask permission yourself of anybody who appeared to be on the property? I wasn't there when my mom asked Errol Avery for permission to search the property. And he gave permission, right? Freely? Yes, he gave permission. Is there some reason you look at them every time you answer, other than looking at me? No. Have you been told to do that by somebody from the district attorney's office? No. Did you prepare for your testimony today? No, I did not. Okay. So, he gave you permission, right? Yes. He gave us permission. Did you get his name? Yes. What was it? Errol. Okay. He didn't hesitate to give you permission to check anywhere you wanted, right? No, he did not hesitate. Okay. It didn't appear as if he had anything to hide from you? No. Okay. Not to my knowledge. You said as you were going through the beginning vehicles, you were looking for either Teresa 
or any articles that would appear to be hers, right? Correct. So you were looking carefully inside each vehicle, not just looking at the outside of the vehicles, right? We were trying to glance into the vehicles and look anywhere that was open. Some of the trunks were open. Did you open any doors? No. You never opened up any doors of the other vehicles? No. Okay. But you were looking inside those vehicles, even though they were not obviously not Teresa's vehicle, right? No, they didn't fit the description of Teresa's vehicle. I understand. Even though they didn't fit the description, you were looking inside those vehicles as well to see if you could see anything, right? Correct. Anything like Teresa herself, right? Her body? Correct. Or anything that would look like hers? Correct. Okay, then when you got to the RAV4, your mom was not sure if it was the same one or not. Correct. And so you were looking inside that vehicle to see, again, if there was anything that would indicate to you any articles of Teresa's. Correct. Okay. So you were looking carefully inside there because you were trying at that point to make some determination of whether that was really was Teresa's vehicle, right? I was looking for things like the license plate or anything that could look at we could look at that we had information about to be able to identify if the vehicle was hers or not or anything any writing that might have her name on it right yeah any personal effects that you could that you could use to help you identify that the vehicle was actually teresa's right correct so it was important to look inside the vehicle not just at the outside right correct you saw no blood whatsoever did you it was a dark or very dark interior. Ma'am, did you see any blood? Judge, I will object as argumentative. She's trying to answer the question. If it's not yes or no, she should be able to explain. That is a yes or no question. If the explanation is not sufficient on cross, you can ask it on redirect. I will do that, so, Judge. So, yes or no, did you see any blood? No. You didn't have a flashlight with you, you said, right? No. I said I did not have a flashlight, yes. Nevertheless, we are talking about a Saturday morning, right? It was daylight. Correct. In fact, it was 10.30 in the morning, something like that. Correct. It was not, it was not raining. No, it was not raining. It was not terribly dark. It was a typical cloudy November day at 10.30 in the morning, right? It was a cloudy day at 10.30 in the morning. Okay. And the trees that you mentioned were around it. None of the trees had leaves on them, did they? No, but it was very brushy area with trees versus the other flat areas that were, we were looking at where there was nothing blocking the other vehicles. All right. Now, you knew that in fact, your mother warned you that it was important that you not touch the vehicle, the RAV4 that you found, right? Correct. You were doing your best not to alter the scene, correct? Correct. And not only did you not want to touch the vehicle, 
you didn't want to touch any of the branches or debris or anything else up against it either, did you? Not with my bare hands, no. Okay. The only thing you ever touched, even with a tissue, were the door handles. Is that right? To reach one of the door handles, I did have to pull back. I believe it was a salvage part to be able to reach the door handle. I did that with the tissue as well. All right. So did you move something that was against the vehicle itself? I just took the tissue and pulled it back so I would be able to reach the door handle. That would be the hood that was propped up against it? I would have to see the picture to identify it. Would you put up Exhibit 30, Council? I think that is it right there up on the screen yes okay it was some salvage part that in order for you to get to the door handle on the right rear door you had to move that panel i did not necessarily physically move it i just pulled it back and checked the door and reached over right okay Let's go to Exhibit 29, please. Did you see Exhibit 29 up there? Yes. That is a photo of the rear of the RAV4? Yes. And there is a door handle on that door too, correct? Correct. You didn't check that one to see if it was locked, did you? No, I did not. And if you could go to exhibit 33, please. Thank you. Thank you. That is a picture. By the way, you are the one who took all of these pictures? That's correct. Okay. That is a picture of, it shows sort of the driver's side area of the RAV4, right? Correct. There's sort of a walkway or a walk area, I suppose, between the RAV4 and this red vehicle, whatever it is. Correct. By the way, just so we're clear, this RAV4 was found up along the ridge area of the border of the property, right? I wouldn't know whether it was, a was the border. Okay. Well, there's a single row of cars up along that area, right? Correct. And there they were all sort of bumper to bumper, linked up like you would parallel park a bunch of cars along the street. Is that correct? Correct. This was the only one that was sort of double parked where it was next to or where it was two by two, right? I don't recall at this time if it was the only one that was double parked. Okay. But it was the only one with any kind of debris piled on it, right? Correct. It was the only one with any kind of branches piled on it, correct? Correct. You said to us that it was obvious that it appeared that somebody was trying to conceal it. Is that correct? Correct. In that sense, then, that made it very difficult, that, very different than any other vehicles, right? It made us suspicious, yes. It made it stand out, the fact that it was, because it was the only one that was covered like that, right? That, and the fact that it was similar to the description of the vehicle that was Teresa's. Okay, so it was not so concealed that you couldn't tell what it was when you got near it, right? Can you rephrase that? It was not so covered up with items that when you got anywhere near it, that you were unable to determine it was even a RAV4, was it? No, I could tell it was a RAV4. Okay. So it was just sitting there for anyone to find 
who would be looking through the salvage area, right? If you were on foot searching, yes. Okay. Now, from Exhibit 33, you said that you were trying to get the VIN number off of the vehicle, right? Correct. And the VIN number for this particular vehicle, in fact, or for most, I think, are, it's on the dash, kind of at the very end of the windshield, kind of down by the windshield wipers. Isn't that correct? That was where we were looking on this vehicle, yes. I don't know if you knew that before, but you learned it that day. Is that correct? Yes. You were told by the officers that your mom was talking to on the phone. That is where you should direct your attention? After searching elsewhere on the vehicle, yes. Okay. By the way, that VIN is stamped. Is It's in the dash in black, right there in black metal? Correct. The VIN itself is a black number, just kind of raised? Correct. Or recessed, bumped, something like that, right? So to see it, you have to get pretty close, don't you? With an, you know, eyesight, yes. In order to do that, you have to walk around to, where did you walk along? From the rear? Did you approach it from the rear or did you approach it from the front? I don't recall that at this time, which way I approached the vehicle to check the VIN number. Can you get to it either way? I mean, could you come around to the front and lean over and look from there? Or did you have to go around the rear and come up alongside of the vehicle in order to get to the front? I don't recall at this time. Okay, that's fair. Now, you said you waited around 20 minutes or so before the first officers arrived? Approximately 20 minutes. But during that time, you had retreated over near where the crusher was? Yes, correct. That is what, about 900 feet or 1,000 feet away or something like that? I can only make an approximation. I would say it would probably be five blocks, maybe four blocks, city blocks. Okay. Then the first to arrive were the Manitowoc officers? That's correct. And did you see a Manitowoc officer walk up toward the vehicle? Correct. More than one? I recall one officer. Okay. Approaching the vehicle. How many Manitowoc officers arrived first? One or two? I don't recall the exact number of officers that arrived. Several? I made contact with one officer, and I remember the other officers walked to the vehicle. Well, you were watching carefully, you said, to see what was going on, right? Correct. Were you watching because you were concerned that the police might somehow plant something in that vehicle? No. That thought never occurred to you, did it? No. Of course not. So your only concern was if anybody other than police officers would come by the, to the scene of the RAV4 and disturb it in any way, right? That was your focus? That and the focus that we needed to make sure it was her vehicle. Sure. So once the Manitowoc police officers arrived, you were put at ease a little bit that at least some law enforcement was there, correct? I wouldn't say we were put at ease. Well, you were no longer alone at this strange auto, auto salvage yard with other people milling about, correct? Correct. Now, there was law enforcement there, right? Correct. And they had guns, right? 
I would assume they had their guns. So your real interest at that point was if this was really Teresa's car, that it was that you were uh, concerned about. Correct. And at some point, did one of the officers come back and tell you that? One of the Manitowoc officers? I don't recall if it was a Manitowoc officer or Calumet at that time. Okay. How long was it before the Calumet officers arrived on the scene, if you know? I can only make an approximation. I would say it was a few minutes. Okay. How many of them arrived? I don't recall the exact number of officers that arrived. Were they in marked squads or unmarked squads? I don't recall if it was unmarked or marked. Were they uniformed or not uniformed? The, te the detectives I spoke to was an ununiformed officer. Ununiformed, did you say? Yeah. Plain clothes. Did you see any marked Calumet squads arrive there in the area of the RAV4? I don't recall if it was marked or unmarked. So you don't know whether any officers that were coming or going were Manitowoc or Calumet, right? Not unless they identified themselves. The plainclothes detective identified himself as Calumet. So the one detective identified himself, right? Yes. And the others didn't? Or did they? I did not have direct contact with all of the officers who arrived at the scene. So you don't recall if they were marked cars and you don't remember seeing any Calumet uniforms? You don't know if the officers who arrived were from Calumet or Manitowoc, right? They don't have distinguishing uniforms. They were all brown. So they were just police officers, right? Correct. But at some point, I believe, on direct, you said that you did see some. Well, let me go back and ask it this way. Did you see any Manitowoc uniformed officers at the scene? As I said, I didn't distinguish based on their uniforms. They are all brown. So at that point in time, the people that I spoke to had identified themselves as Manitowoc or Calumet, but I didn't speak with every officer that was there. When you say the people that you spoke to, it was one person that you spoke to, right? No. I spoke to both Manitowoc and Calumet County officers. You did? Correct. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. I apologize. Were they wearing uniforms or plain clothes? Plain clothes detectives. So you talked to two plain clothes detectives? One said he was from Manitowoc and one said he was from Calumet? That's right. So you saw somebody that was uniformed approach the RAV4 or not? An ununiformed officer did approach the RAV4. Okay, did you ever see somebody that you could readily discern was a Calumet officer as opposed to a Manitowoc officer? come up and relieve the Manitowoc officer who was near the RAV4? I couldn't discern whether they were Manitowoc or Calumet. Okay, so you don't know if or when any Calumet officers took over responsibility for that RAV4 itself, do you? No. You said you were there at the property, the Avery Salvage property, until about noon or 12.30. That's correct. But before that time, you and your mother had sort of retreated from the car crusher area 
farther north over toward the entryway, didn't you? No, we stayed near the car crusher area. So you stayed near the car crusher when you gave your statements? Yes. And the entire time you were on that property, you were just right near the car crusher? Yes. You never went anywhere else further away to talk with officers by any other vehicles? By what vehicles? By any other vehicles on any other area of the lot? No. You were standing next to your mother the whole time? Yes. Okay. Now, Miss Sturm, have you ever locked yourself out of your car? Yes. Did you call the police to help you get in? No. Do you know anybody else who has? No. Do you know if you needed to, if you couldn't find anyone else to get your keys to get into your vehicle, you could call a police officer and he would help you get into your vehicle, right? I called a locksmith. Okay. But do you know you could call an officer? Many times people do call officers for that purpose. No, when it happened to me, I called the locksmith. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Mr. Cross. Ms. Sturm, the defense attorney had oh. asked you about looking in the vehicle and whether you could see inside the vehicle. Do you remember those questions? Yes. Was it easy to see into those windows? No, it was not easy. I will have you take a look at Exhibit 33, although we will be looking at some others. Is there anything different about the rear windows at the front than the front driver's windows? The rear windows had a tint to them. And as you can see from the pictures here, as I'm sure other people have done, there is glare in the windows. So if you really wanted to see inside, and if you weren't concentrated about trying to disrupt the scene at all, you would have to cut your hands over the vehicle to make sure you were blocking out the glare and the shadows, which we didn't do. You did not do? No. I will show you exhibit number 30 and ask you to describe the tint on the back windows. The rear and back windows were darkly tinted. The front wheel windshield and the driver's and passenger's doors were not. So, once again, you can see there is definitely a glare. Ms. Derm, whether the officers were Calumet County or Manitowoc County, did any officer approach that vehicle? No officer touched the vehicle while we were present. Did you see any officer pull out a device or try to pry open the door or anything like that while you were there? No. If that would have happened, would you have seen it? Yes, definitely. Okay, that's all I have of Ms. Stern. Nothing further. Very well, you are excused. The state will call Bobby Dassey to the stand. State your full name and spell your last name, please. Bobby Dassey, D-A-S-S-E-Y. Mr. Dassey, how old are you? 20. Can you tell us where you live, please? Well, I live out right outside Mishcott on Avery Road. Do you know the defendant, Stephen Avery? Yes. He is my uncle. You have to speak up just a little bit, please. Yes, he is my uncle. Is he in the courtroom here at this time? Oh, yes, he is. Would you point him out for the record and tell the judge where he is seated? Right over there to my right. Sitting next to his two attorneys? Yes. 
Judge, I would ask the record to reflect the defendant's identification. The record will reflect the witness identified Mr. Avery. Mr. Dassey, do you know where, at least during the fall of 2005, prior to November 5th, where your uncle lived? Oh, yes, he lived right next door to us. I will ask you to describe the kind of residence that, first of all, that you live in. We live in, I would say, a mobile home, a three-bedroom house mobile home. On October 31st, 2005, who all lived in your home? My mom, my stepdad, my two younger brothers. What were the names of your younger brothers? Blaine and Brendan. Blaine and Brandon? Brandon. Bobby, do you recall October 31st of 2005? Yes. Could you tell the jury if you were employed at that time? Yes, I was. I worked at Fisher's Hamilton's third shift. What time would you start work on any day? I would start at 10 at night and work until 6 in the morning. On October 31st of 2005, could you tell the jury if you were home during the daytime hours? Oh, yes, I was. And how late or how long were you home until? I was home until 2.30 that day. What were you doing before 2.30? Uh, sleeping. When you say 2.30, are you talking about the afternoon or morning? Uh, in the afternoon. To your knowledge, Bobby, was anybody else at home with you? N no. Do you remember anything unusual that happened at about 2.30 that afternoon? A vehicle had drove up and started taking pictures of the van. All right. Let's back up just a minute. Were you still sleeping? Or did you wake up? I was up by 2.30, yeah. At 2.30, did you see something? Yes. What did you see? I seen a vehicle pull up in our driveway. Do you recall which window you were looking from? Uh, through the front window in the front kitchen, uh, in front of the kitchen table. Bobby, could you describe that vehicle for the jury, please? Uh, it was a light green SUV, SUV like a teal color. How do you know that it was about 2.30 in the afternoon? Uh, well, because I was going hunting that night, uh, so that was the time I wanted to get up. I got up at 2. All right. From which way did this blue or teal SUV drive in as you were looking out the window? Toward the west, it would be. Can you tell the jury, please, from which direction your uncle's trailer is from your house? The west. Did you know what kind of SUV it was? Uh, not at the time. All right. After seeing that vehicle driving up the roadway, tell the jury what you saw then. Uh, I seen Teresa Halbach get out of the vehicle and started taking pictures. What was she taking pictures of? A maroon van. A what? A maroon van. Can you tell us about this vehicle? Where was it parked? It was parked right in front of our house. Now, you told this jury it was Teresa Halbach that had taken the picture. How do you know that? Uh, now I know that. At the time, I didn't. And what did this woman look like? 
Uh, she was about maybe five eight. She had brown, short, shorter like hair. She had a black coat on that went past the hips. Was she wearing pants or a skirt? Oh, she was wearing pants. Now, about this fan. What can you tell the jury about that fan? It was a 1989 Plymouth Voyager. It had lots of miles on it. It was my mom's band. She had it for a couple years. I don't know really much more about it. All right. As you were looking out the window, you said that you saw a woman taking pictures. Can you describe that, please? Well, I, I seen her take one picture of the front of the van. Then I went in and took a share. Okay. After seeing her taking some pictures, did you see her do anything else? She started, before I got in the share, she actually started walking over towards Stephen's trailer. You could see that from your location? Uh, yeah, through the window, yeah. You said walking towards Stephen's trailer. What does that mean? She walked toward it, to the door. How close to the door did she get before you stopped watching? Maybe 25 yards. Did you see her enter your uncle's trailer? No. Why not? Because I wanted to take a share. Uh, I didn't pay no attention to it. All right. Was there anybody with her at that time? No. Was there anybody outside or making contact with her outside by the vehicle? No. And after seeing this woman walking toward your Uncle Stephen's trailer, did you ever see this woman again? Oh, no. How long was it that you were in the shower? Do you remember? Uh, maybe three or four minutes. Okay. What did you do then? Uh, got dressed and left to, to go hunting. Now, when you left to go hunting, did you have a vehicle on the premises? Yes. Can you tell the jury what kind of vehicle it was? A black Chevy Blazer. Where was that parked? It was parked uh, right between the house and the garage. About what time do you think you left to go hunting? Uh, probably 20 to 3, quarter to 3. Quarter to 3. Bobby, how do you know that was the time? What is that time important? Why is that time important as it relates to hunting? Well, that is when the deer start moving. They, they go on their feeding patterns then. Pardon? They go on their feeding patterns then. Where did you go hunting that day? Uh, it was actually maybe two miles up the road from my house. What kind of hunting was it? Deer hunting, bow hunting. Mr. Dassey, when you walked out to your vehicle to go bow hunting, did you notice if that teal or blue SUV was still in the driveway? Yes, it was. It was? Yes. Did you see Ms. Havak? No. Did you see any signs of her at all? No. What did you do then? I proceeded to leave. I got in my vehicle and I left. Did you hunt that day? Yes. Did you get anything that day? No. I, I seen a deer or two. I, I, I didn't get anything, no. All right. After deer hunting, what did you do? I uh, came home, and I laid down, and I went to sleep again. What time did you get home? Do you recall? It was five-ish. Now, when you drove back home at about five o'clock in the afternoon, 
Was Ms. Harbaugh's vehicle still visible? No. What did you do when you got home? I watched TV for a little bit, then I went to bed. Did you go to sleep? Yes. How long did you sleep? Probably three hours. Let me back up just a few minutes, Bobby. At any time during the morning or early afternoon hours, did you receive any phone calls at your residence? Not that I'm aware of. Why don't you tell us what that means? Not that you are aware of. Uh, well, I'm a real deep sleeper. Uh, when I sleep, I don't hear nothing. If the phone rings, would you have heard it? No. After getting up that afternoon, did you check for any messages or check the answering machine? Oh, no. I, no, no. Now, you mentioned that while you were home that day, you didn't think anybody was home when you got up and when you left. After you went bow hunting, was anybody home at that time? No. Are you familiar with your brother's schedules? That is, your brothers that were at school? Yes. What brothers went to school at that time? Blaine and Brendan. Are you familiar with when Blaine and Brendan usually got home from school? They usually got home at quarter to four. That would be 3.45? 3.45, yeah. So, about an hour after you would have left to go deer hunting? Yes. When you got home at about five o'clock, Bobby... Were Blaine and Brendan home? I, I can't recall. All right. Now, you have a fourth brother or a third brother. Is that correct? Yes. What is his name? Brian. Do you know where Brian was at that time? He was at work. Now, was Brian, was Brian living at your home at the time, too? Uh, no. Where was Brian staying at the time? He lived in Managed Walk with his girlfriend. What is your mother's name? Barb. And is Barb related to Mr. Avery, if you know? Yes. How? Sister. Brother and sister. When you got up and went bow hunting, and left for bow hunting. Was your mother at home at that time? Uh, no, she was at work. When you got home from deer hunting, was your mother home yet? No. Do you recall your mom coming home or seeing her that night? Uh, when I got up at nine o'clock, I seen her. All right. I think I asked this, Bubby. I'm sorry. But what time do you start work? I start work at 10. 10 p.m.? Yep, 10 p.m. Where is the place that you work? What city is it located in? The two rivers. Bobby, the rest of that week, after the 31st of October, do you recall the rest of that week? Uh, some of it. That weekend, that Friday and Saturday, the 4th and 5th, did other family members go somewhere that weekend? Yeah, they went up north. What does up north mean? Up to Crivets. Do you know what is up in Crivets? My grandpa has a cabin up there. Do you know what family members went up north that weekend? Uh, Stephen, Brendan went, Brian went, and my grandma and grandpa went up there. Stephen, Brendan, and Brian, you didn't go? Nope. Do you remember why you didn't go? I had to work that Sunday night. 
Let's go back to the 31st, your work schedule. You said that you worked at 10 o'clock. Is that right? Yes. Do you remember what time you left home for work? Probably about 9.30. At 9.30 p.m. on the 31st of October. Did you see anything when you left your house? Not that I recall. Did you see anything by your uncles? I didn't even look. Now, that weekend, that Saturday, the 5th of November, do you recall that day at all? No. Do you remember something being found on the Avery property that Saturday? Her vehicle. That is the day I'm talking about. Do you now remember that day? Not really. All right. Do you remember where you were when that vehicle was found? I was by my friend's house. What is your friend's first name? Mike. How were you notified, if you remember, that Teresa's vehicle was found on the Avery property? The TV and my mom. Now, Bubby, at the time, back on the 31st of October, did you have any pets? Yes, I just got a black lab. She was two months old. Was that an inside or an outside dog? Inside dog. On the 31st of October, when you went hunting, did you take your dog with you? No. When you went to your friend Mike's house on Saturday the 5th, did you take your black lab with you? No. Were you able to get back home on the 5th of November? No. Tell us why not. Well, they had the road all blocked off. They wouldn't let anybody in there. Who is they? The police officers. How about your dog? What happened to your black lab? I had to wait like three hours in order to get her. In order to get her? Yeah. How did you get her? I had to give my statement and everything. Then they, then the investigator went in and got her. They got your dog for you? Uh, basically, yeah. Now, Bobby, on the 3rd of November, that would be a Thursday, I believe. Do you recall having a conversation with your Uncle Stephen? Regarding a body? Yes. Could you tell us what your Uncle Stephen told you that day? Well, my buddy Mike was over too, and he asked us, uh, it sounded like he was joking, honestly. He asked us if we wanted to help get rid of a body. Your Uncle Stephen asked you if you wanted to help get rid of a body? Yeah. What was your response? No. Bobby, are you familiar with a Suzuki Samurai? A gray Suzuki Samurai? Yes. Where was that vehicle, please? That was in Stephen's garage. He, he was going to fix it up. On the 31st of October, do you recall where that Suzuki Samurai was? I don't even know. Do you remember generally where it was parked? No. If you don't know, that's fine. I don't know. All right. Bobby, have you ever seen a fire, like a bonfire, by your Uncle Stevens? Yes. Do you remember the last time you saw a bonfire by your Uncle Stevens? Maybe two weeks before that, before all this happened. There, let me just ask you, is there some place where your Uncle Stephen would have fires? Yes, right behind his garage. Can you describe that area for us? 
Uh, it was a mound of gravel that he basically burned stuff on. If I could have a moment with counsel, Judge. Bobby, we have had some photographs, Mark. I will have you identify some of these. In fact, all of them, to help the jury understand what we are talking about. The first exhibit I want you to take a look at is exhibit number 37. Can you tell us what that is, please? While he is doing that, Your Honor, I have a concern that I want noted now and that I would like the right and that I would like the raise outside of the jury's presence between the direct and cross of Mr. Dassey. Are you saying you would like to raise it out of the jury's presence now or later? No, not now. If we can take that up between the direct and the cross, that would be fine. Very well. Tell us what Exhibit 37 is, please. That is Stephen's trailer. Stephen. Avery's trailer. I will let the jury now see exhibit 37. Can you tell us kind of what else is shown there? What are we looking at? Well, the red thing is Stephen's trailer. The garage is to the left. That is his truck sitting there, and that is his burning barrel right in front of the house. If I could have one moment, Judge. I will give you a laser pointer. There is a button there. Using the laser pointer, again, Bobby, can you show us where Stephen's trailer is? Uh, Stephen's trailer is right there. Okay, you mentioned the burning barrel. The burning barrel would be right there. Whose burning barrel is that? That would be Stephen's burning barrel. Where is Stephen's garage? Right there. All right. The next exhibit is number 38. Can you tell us what that is, please? It's in front of the next picture, 38. Uh, just another picture of Stephen's trailer uh, and his garage. It's a little different angle. Is that right? Yes. I will now let the jury look at Exhibit 38. Tell us what we were we are looking at, please. But basically, just looking at Stephen's trailer again and his garage and his truck. What is Exhibit 39, please? It's a closer look, closer shot of T uh, Stephen's trailer. We're letting the jury see Exhibit 39. Where would Stephen's main entrance be? How do you get in the trailer? Uh, through the door, uh, right beside, right by the step there. The record will reflect that you are pointing to the entrance furthest to the right of this trailer. Is that correct? Yes. Does the photograph help you? Or could you describe for the jury about how close Miss Havox was to that trailer when you stopped watching her approach? Uh, she was probably uh, right about there. Looking which way? Toward the trailer, west. Exhibit 40 is the next exhibit. Would you describe what that is, please? Just a closer view of Stephen's front door. That is the door where we were talking about, we lost our batteries here, Judge. While we are getting new batteries for our remote control, I will ask you some other questions, Bobby. First of all, how often would your Uncle Stephen have fires at his property? Uh, maybe one or two every month. You mentioned that Stephen, or you identified, at least, Stephen's garage. Who uses Stephen's garage? Stephen does. Does anybody else have access to it? At that time, no. All right. 
even though the batteries are not changed yet, or they are kind of going bad, we will do the best we can until we get some new ones. This is exhibit 40 that you have identified. What are we looking at here? That's, that is Stephen's front door, the main entrance. There is what looks like a deck that goes around the trailer. Can you explain that, please? Yes, basically uh, a deck that runs around the whole trailer. Uh, he has got a little plateau at the end. Uh, see the next picture in front of you? Exhibit 41? Yes. Can you tell us what that is, please? That is just a picture of the uh, the door uh, to the far left of the trailer. All right. We are now letting the jury look at Exhibit 41. Again, what are we looking at? That is just another door to Stephen's trailer. Now, on the left there, the leftmost edge of Exhibit 41, is that the door that you are talking about? Yes. Do you know where that door goes? It goes into the hallway of the trailer, closest to the bedroom in the back. Have you been in Stephen's trailer before? Yes. On the 31st of October, did you have keys to Stephen's trailer? No. Do you know if anyone else from your home had keys to his trailer? No. No, you don't know? Or no, they didn't? No one did. All right. The next exhibit in front of you is exhibit 42. Tell us what that is. This is a picture of the back of Stephen's trailer. Do you want to take the laser pointer now that the jury can see exhibit 42? Why don't you tell us what we are looking at? Uh, this is the back side. This is the side that faces north. That is the back of Stephen's trailer. Uh, that is his pool. Now, there is a back patio door on that trailer? Yes. Can you show us that, please? That would be right there. Just so the record is clear, Judge, he is pointing at what would be just about the very middle of the trailer. That is the patio door. Is that correct, Bobby? Yes. What kind of pool is that? Just a pool that is like four feet deep. Okay. Exhibit 43 is the next exhibit in front of you. Can you tell us what that is, please? Just another view of the back of Stephen's trailer. Now, we will let the jury take a look. It's a different angle, pretty much the same as Exhibit 42. Yes. Which way have we moved around, or the camera? Which way? Yeah. It has moved to the right, uh, south. Exhibit 43 shows Stephen's back patio door. Yes. Could you show us that, please? Right there. Now, behind Stephen's trailer, exhibit, excuse me, behind Stephen's garage, does Stephen have a doghouse? Yes. Does exhibit 43 show that? Yes. If you could point out the doghouse for us, please. Right there. Directly behind the doghouse. What is that area? That would be the burning pit. You had mentioned, Bobby, before about seeing the fires at Stevens. Where on this property did you see those fires? Uh, right there. Directly behind this garage? Yes. The next exhibit that we are asking you to identify is Exhibit 44. Tell us what that is, please. Uh, this is another shot of Stephen's house and his garage. Now, 
The jury can see Exhibit 44. What are we looking at? Uh, basically, uh, you are looking at Stephen's trailer again, the garage, and the doghouse and his truck. Uh, again, right there is where he had his burning pit. His burning pit? Yeah. Now, this exhibit, that is Exhibit 44. Do you know about where this was taken from? Uh, this actually was taken right in front of our house. Is this east or west or north or south of Stephen's trailer? Do you know? It would be east. Okay. The next exhibit is Exhibit 45. Can you tell us what that is, please? Uh, that is a picture of Stephen's garage. Again, now that the jury can see exhibit number 45, why don't you take the laser pointer and tell us what we are looking at? Uh, basically, this is uh, just Stephen's garage again and his truck. That is the door he mainly used uh, to, the, to the garage. That is what? You have to speak up. That is the door he mainly used for the garage. Kind of a service door? Yeah. All right. The next exhibit is number 46. Can you tell us what that is, please? Another picture of Stephen's garage. All right. Exhibit 46. Now that the jury can see it again, can you explain what we are looking at? Uh, just another picture of Stephen's garage. Is the service door open or closed? It's open. That burning pit or burn area, can you tell us where that is on this picture? It would be right there where that white gravel is. Right behind the garage? Yes. What is Exhibit 47? A picture of Stephen's burning pit. All right. Now that the jury can see Exhibit 47, why don't you tell us what we are looking at? You were just looking at Stephen's burning pit directly behind the garage. Do you recognize anything else in this picture? There is a seat. What do you mean? A seat. From a vehicle right there, and his trailer is there. The dog coop is there. Bobby, had you seen that seat out there by your Uncle Stephen's house? Not the dog recall. Now, on Exhibit 47, if you can show us, more specifically, where the burning happened where the burn area is. Uh, right around there. There is a blackened area, which would be just west and just right of the car seat. Is that the place that you are pointing? Yes. What is the next exhibit? Uh, the picture directly behind Stephen's garage. That is exhibit 48. Is that right? Yes. Now that the jury can see Exhibit 48, tell us what we're looking at. Basically, the back of Stephen's trailer, there is a dog coop again. That is where his burning pit would be. The dog what? The dog coop. The dog coop? C-O-O-P? Yeah, or dog house. Where is Stephen's garage? Right there. That is the building to the very right of the exhibit. Is that correct? Yes. And where is Stephen's trailer? Right there. So, the red building, just to the west. Is that correct? Yes. Again, where is the burn area? Uh, this is partially shown in the picture to the far south of the picture. 
The next exhibit is number 49. Tell the jury what this is, please. Another picture of behind Stephen's garage. Now that the jury can see exhibit 49, would you again tell us what we are looking at? Just looking at the same picture as before, that doghouse, the garage, his trailer. Uh, that is where the burning pit would be. What is the next exhibit, 50? A picture of the burning pit just at a different angle. There is something else in this picture as well. Is that correct? Yes. What is that? That is his dog. Do you know the name of that dog? His name is Bear. Bear? Yes. Whose dog was that? Stevens. Pointing to Exhibit 50, can you show us the area where things were burned? Uh, right there. That would be directly in front of the dog? Yes. Can you tell us about Bear? Would the animal, the dog of Stephen Avery, usually be an inside dog or an outside dog? Oh, outside dog. Do you know how long Bear's chain was? Where Bear would be able to wander? 15 feet. Okay. Now, in the back of this picture, the background of Exhibit 50, do you see any vehicles? Yes. What do you see? The Maroon Plymouth Voyager. Can you point that out? Uh, yes, right there. That car is not far, or just to the right of the garage? Yes. That is the same vehicle you saw Teresa Halbach taking photos of? Yes. I don't know if you were able to answer this, Bobby, but I will ask you. What was Bear's personality or demeanor like, if you know? Do you know what I'm asking you? Uh, he was really calm. The next picture is Exhibit 51. What is that, please? That is a picture of Stephen's burn barrel. Where was this burn barrel located? Northwest of Stephen's trailer. In the background of that picture, you also see a vehicle. Is that correct? Yes. What vehicle is that? That is the Plymouth Voyager again. You also see a road between the burn barrel and the vehicle. Is that correct? Yes. Can you describe that road for us, please? That would be the driveway leading down to Stevens trailer. Now, Mr. Dassey, does Exhibit 51 help you? Or could you help explain or show the jury where you saw Ms. Habak walking before you took your shower? She was walking right about there, walked right through there. Walking in a westerly direction towards Stevens? Yes. The next exhibit is Exhibit 52. Tell us what that is, please. That would be a picture of our burning barrels. What do you mean, our burning barrels? My mom's burning barrels. How many were there? Three. Are you sure? I don't know. I thought there were three. Okay. Where were the burn barrels located? Uh, in our backyard, right behind our garage. And this picture has some people in it. Do you know who these people are? No. Now, to the left, or behind the burn barrels, are some vehicles. Do you know how far away those are? In other words, how close to your property we are looking at? That's a bad question. Let me try it again. The burn barrels. How close were they to the edge of what would be your mom's property? 
25 yards or 30 yards. The next exhibit is exhibit 53. This is going to look familiar, but what is that? Uh, just another view of Steven's trailer. From a little different angle, is that right? Yes. What is exhibit 54? That is a picture of our house, my mom's house. Let's talk about that a little bit. Now that the jury can see exhibit 54, please take the laser pointer and tell them what they are looking at. Now, this is basically my mom's house. That is our golf cart. Your what? Our golf cart. Okay. This would be the side of our house to the far farthest west. The burning barrels would be right back there. You can't see them on there. Could you tell us or show us in this picture the window that you were looking out when you watched Ms. Habak? That window right there. Okay. And now that the vehicle is for sale and I know that the vehicle for sale is not shown in this picture, but which direction was it? Can you kind of show us? Uh, it would be right over there. To the right off screen? Yes. The next exhibit is exhibit 55. Can you tell us what that would be? That would be my mom's answering machine. Where was that located? In our living room. Again, now that the jury is able to see Exhibit 55, what kind of an answering machine was it? Do you know? No. Is there a phone that went with it? Yes. Where did the phone go? I don't know. But what I mean is, was the phone placed on a cradle or something on this phone? Yes. Where is that? It's not on there. Okay. Had you ever used that answering machine? No, I don't use it at all. Have you ever retrieved a message from that answering machine? Yes. How do you retrieve a message from it? Uh, you just hit play. The next exhibit for the jury is exhibit 56. Have you ever seen that before? Yes, that would be my grandmother's. Just a second. I think, Mr. Kratz, it's 10.30. I think we will take our morning break. We can certainly do that, Judge. I will remind you again, members of the jury, not to discuss the case at any time during the course of the trial, including during any breaks. We will see you in 15 minutes. You may be seated. Mr. Kratz, did you have something first? Yes. Since there are several photos, I believe we have received a stipulation as to their admissibility. I understand that each should be shown one at a time, but I think the court knows the technological limitations that we are having. Trying to toggle through this remote control so that only one is shown at a time or only after Mr. Dassey identifies what it is. I'm wondering if there's a better way, or if there is an opportunity that we may show these in a more efficient fashion, perhaps one photo after another, without having to go to the blue screen every time. I can certainly do that. It's Mr. Strang's call. I understand that, Judge. This is simply a request to make it a little easier for the jury to watch these and those and look at these exhibits, which I believe to be stipulated as to their admissibility. Mr. Strang. I think we should continue to do it this way. There is a concern, or I imagine there are many witnesses who will have as many photographs to go through. The concern is not the authenticity of the photographs, or their admissibility, but rather the kind of things that appear on the screen. When Mr. Kratz has the laptop in his desk, he can stop the projection, the projecting of them 
up there before the one exhibit has been selected. And, you know, this is just a good method to do it. Because we may get some photographs where, for some reasons or not, they ought not to be published to the jury, whether because the witness can't identify it or whatever reason. Oh, right. That's fine. All I can do is ask, Judge. I understand. Mr. Strang, was there something else you wished to take up? There was. There is the matter that I raised and noted that I wanted it recorded, that I had raised the matter. But it could wait for our break to raise it. I wanted to do some check-in through the discovery too before I did it. My recollection of Bobby Dassey's testimony was that he said that on Thursday, November 3rd, 2005, in the presence of Bobby Dassey and his friend, Mike, he didn't identify him further than as Mike, that Stephen Avery asked if they wanted to help get rid of a body or the body. I'm not clear. I didn't write this down better. But at the time, Bobby said that he thought Steve was joking about that, and it was shortly after that testimony that I interjected briefly, as I did. We have no written summary of an interview of Bobby Dassey in which that statement is recited, so the immediate concern was disclosure of oral statements to the defendant that the state intends to use at trial, I think under section 971 dot two three one b we do have a calumet sheriff's department report of a contact with michael osmundson o s m u n s o n where for council's benefit and the courts is page 259 of the calumet county sheriff's department report that report which is not an interview of bobby dassey recites a statement of this michael osmundson that he and Bobby were inside the Dassey garage when Stephen came over and he goes on from there. I think probably here, the best thing for me to do is, what I will do is just read this for the court's benefit now and make this a court exhibit, page 259 of the report. The first chance I get, we will make a copy of it. I will read the relevant paragraph in its entirety. Michael indicated the only time he had been at the Avery property between 10.31.05 and 11.14.05 was on Thursday 11.10.05. He stated he and Bobby were inside the Dassey garage when Stephen came over. Michael indicated he was aware Stephen was one of the last people to see the missing girl and jokingly asked to, uh, asked Stephen if Stephen had her, the missing girl, in a closet. At this point, Stephen asked Michael if Michael wanted to help bury the body, and they laughed about this together. Michael stated he had just learned about the missing girl on the Tuesday prior to that. He once again indicated he thought Stephen might have been the last one to see the missing girl. End of the rele relevant paragraph. Although the following one sentence paragraph says, according to Michael, Stephen stated people go missing all the time and this girl may have left or may, quote, have left for Mexico, period, close quote. Now, although we have been told that Bobby is in the garage at the same time, there is no indication that Bobby overhears the statement. Moreover, there was a different context for the statement laid out here than what Bobby gave. That is, Michael himself is joking with Stephen, jesting with him about having the girl in the closet. This is clearly a joke in response to the jest. We have help bury the body instead of help get rid of the body. But most significant of all, this conversation clearly takes place on Thursday, November 10th, 2005, not Thursday, November 3rd, 2005. And Michael Osmondson says he had just learned about the missing girl on the Tuesday prior to that. Well, that has to be Tuesday, November 8th, 
because on November 1st, no one had reported Theresa Holbeck missing. I was not concerned about Michael Osmondson being a witness in this case. Why? Because Stephen Avery was arrested on November 9th, 2005, and he has been continually, continuously in custody since then and was not in a Dassey garage or gender garage or anyone else's garage on Thursday, November 10th, 2005. Now we have a different witness to whom this statement has never been attributed, of which we have no summary identifying him as someone who overheard the statement or identifying a statement as having been Bobby Dassey as the individual identified or critically identifying the statement as having been made on November 3rd as, 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 at a time when Stephen Avery was not in custody, was at home, or in the salvage yard property. And the implication is this may have been before Theresa Holbeck even is reported missing. In large part, the implication arises because we didn't have the joke that was made to Stephen Avery as the precursor of this. So what I'm left with is this jury having heard testimony from the first blood relative of Mr Avery to testify here, his nephew and next door neighbour, that amounts to a confession of a crime. And under the circumstances, although technically, because Bobby is listed in the reports of contact with Michael Osmondson, Technically, the discovery statutes here may have been complied with. I have not looked at the case law under the discovery statutes, but setting that aside, this comes as an unfair surprise. It's materially different than the summary or the statement of which we have been given notice. There is no way to unwind this from the jury's minds. It has enormous unfair prejudicial impacts. I can think of no remedy, short of asking for a mistrial, on the introduction of this testimony by the state on the direct examination of Bobby Dassey, without having been invited by the defence, or the defence otherwise having opened the door, or done anything to which you could say this would be an invited response. I move, therefore, for a mistrial on the grounds that I have explained. Mr. Cross. Well, Judge, after Mr. Strang concedes that the discovery statute was complied with, or I guess in his words, may very well have been complied with, I will leave the legal analysis to the court. A summary of this conversation was provided, and though although it appears that this Michael fellow got the Thursday wrong, as far as being the third versus the tenth, because Mr. Strang is correct that as of the 10th, Stephen Avery was in custody. This witness did testify consistently with what the story was, that he believed his uncle Stephen was joking, that it was said in a joking manner, and if Mr. Strang wishes to inquire as to the context of it, he may do so on cross-examination. That is what cross-examination is for. It certainly does not rise to the level of material that requires a mistrial. We would ask that the court not do that. Before I go back to Mr. Frank, did I understand that the state indicated they gave that to the defence, not only the Michael Osmondson statement, but also information that Mr. Darcy would testify as he did today? I thought that is what I heard you start to say. No, he got it from, he got page 259 with all of the other discovery, including Mr. Dassey's. I don't know if the conversation is included in Mr. Dassey's report, but it was in Mr. Osmondson's on page 259. This page 259 is the only notice I had of any discovery, any conversation, of anything at all in any form. Indeed, I had asked for any statements of Bobby Dassey. I see no mention of a Mike or Michael or Michael Osmondson anywhere in the report itself that concerns what Bobby Dassey had to say. So, there, I will tell you this caught me completely unaware. Mr. Kratz, I guess I'm not sure 
what was the state expecting? That Mr. Darcy was going to testify to a different date today? To the 10th rather than the 3rd? I don't understand the question, Judge. It was the 3rd. This witness testified that this conversation with Mike, because Stephen was not in custody then, this witness testified it was on the 3rd. Right, but it's my understanding from what I have been told, and you folks have the benefit of that here, I have not seen the report, that is the report from Mr. Osmondson that indicated the conversation took place on the 10th. We will probably have to get page 259. I don't have that in here. Perhaps I can make a better record about that. Perhaps the court can read all of page 259. Mr. Buting, I think, can go across the hall to the clerk's office and get copies of 259 for everyone including the court and counsel for the state. All right, we will take a break. Somebody can have the document brought back to Maya Chambers. I will take a look at it. That's fine, thank you. You may be seated. Is there anything further from either party concerning the defence motion? I have one thing to add, Your Honour. This is because this is serious and I want to get it right. I did not say this until I double checked on the break. But the further reason that I was not concerned and set aside the possibility of the Osmondson statement or the oral statement of the defendant through Osmondson coming in is that the state does not list Michael Osmondson as the, on their witness list. Neither did the defence. His name, nowhere, appears on either party's witness list. And what we have here then on reviewing this is a materially different statement made at an entirely different time and impossible to have been made on the day that Mr. Osmondson says it was made that day. So it's not entirely consistent in the sense that he expresses no uncertainty about it having been November 10th, Thursday, and says that it is because he had learned of Teresa Holbeck being missing on the preceding Tuesday which only could mean not earlier than Tuesday, November 8th, as the court notes. On that record, I can stand. Mr. Kratz. Thank you, Judge. First of all, the court needs to note that there was no violation, at least a statutory discovery violation. The fact that Mr. Strang indicates the impossibility of November 10th, 05, as being the date of this conversation, actually plays in the state's favor and does beg the question why the defense is claiming surprise. Why didn't they do something with this statement? The defense had this information available to them. If the context and the subject matter, and if the dates are wrong, there are many remedies available to the defense. They could have interviewed Osmondson and apparently have chosen not to. They certainly have had access to Bobby Dassey and the entire Dassey family, and I don't know if Mr. Strang has indicated or is representing that they did not interview Bobby Dassey, but that, I think, should be part of the record as well. Secondly, and next, it's important to note the jury is not going to be misled at all in this case. A mistrial is reserved, as this court knows, in serious cases of prosecutorial misconduct or breach or when some other remedy is not going to be available. Given the fact that there is no violation, no discovery violation, certainly a mistrial is not at all appropriate. Let me offer. If there are concerns that the court still has, if the court believes that on cross-examination cannot be dealt with, Mr. Strang still has avail available to him either to interview Mr. Dassey if the court wants to grant brief continuance or to have Mr. Dassey come back to shore this up or interview Mr. Osmondson or to secure Mr. Osmondson's appearance. But the notice of the conversation was provided. The fact that defense did nothing with it, 
the fact that defense failed to interview or failed to appreciate, even if every belief was that it was in a joking manner, the poor joke, that the off-color remark that Mr. Avery apparently made regarding the remains of Ms. Hava, I think that is something perhaps that the defense should have done. But it's not something the court should attribute to the state, nor should a mistrial be the remedy that the court chooses in this case. That is all I have. Judge, thank you. Mr. Strang. First, we have not interviewed Bobby Dassey. Second, the report, which the court now has a copy of, and I ask to be made part of the court record as a court exhibit, again, is that he, Michael, and Bobby were inside the Dassey garage. But from that point forward, describes this as a conversation between Michael and Stephen. So the remedy here is not to repeat this statement again and again in front of the jury or call another witness to change the date. The remedy here is a mistrial or something that effectively would erase this testimony from the jury's consideration because, again, it's a materially different statement under different circumstances on a different date. That has an altogether different meaning and it becomes something a killer would have done as we sit here. As the statement was presented to us, it was impossible to have been made. It was false on its face. So if there was a remedy, short of a mistrial, and I don't think that there is, but if there were a remedy, short of that, it would be something like the court instructing the members of the jury that testimony was given concerning a statement that Mr Avery supposedly made to Bobby and Mike, his friend, on November 3rd, and that the statement was not made, the testimony was false. It was not made, and the testimony about it was false. And at that point, the court, I think, if it were going to adopt a remedy, short of a mistrial, would roll into it with that instruction and connect it with the falsus in uno instruction about Bobby Dassey's testimony, inviting but not instructing the jury that it may disregard as false all of Bobby Dassey's testimony because of his false testimony on this point. I don't know if that would suffice, but that comes much closer to a remedy than repeating it and, you know, rem remaking the statement over and over again on cross-examination or with another witness in front of the jury. I don't have case law at hand on whether the page 259 of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department report technically suffices under section 971.231b or not. I'm assuming here, for the sake of argument, because we are told that Bobby is somewhere in the garage when the statement purportedly is made, I'm assuming for the sake of argument, that the state is just on the right side of the line on discovery. But I have also laid out the practical problems, and a good argument could be made, and I will make it. If there is case law to support it, a good argument can be made that the statement testified to here is so materially different in dates, time and content than the statement of which we were given notice, that they are not the same oral statements. But in any event, I don't think the court has to resolve that. The damages and the problems are clear and are serious. All right. The starting point here is the discovery statute, section 971231B. The statute requires that the prosecution provide the defence a written summary of all oral statements of the defendant. That would be statements of Mr Avery, which the district attorney plans to use in the course of the trial, and the name of the witness who the defendant made the oral statement to. In this case, the court is satisfied that at least, literally, the statute has been complied with, that the disputed testimony involves a statement attributed to the defendant, and there is no dispute that the discovery information provided by the state to the defence included information indicating that both Mr Osmondson and Bobby Darcy were present at the time the defendant made the statement. What is the difference is the date on which the statement was made, and as noted by defence counsel in this argument, 
That can have significant difference here because it can affect the credibility of the statements themselves. I would note at the outset that in terms of assessing the problems presented to the defence here, both from page 259, which was presented to the court and based on a testament of Mr. Dassey, both of the witnesses to the defendant's statement indicated that they thought he was just joking at the time. That is another element in which the information provided to the defence and the testimony given today on the witness stand are consistent with each other. I do agree that I would not fault the defence saying that they didn't take the opportunity to simply follow up on the information on page 259. Because by reading 259, they would have been led to believe that the information contained could have been easily attacked on the basis that the defendant could not have made that statement on November 10th. But they did have information to suggest the statement was made. It's not unusual for a witness to be mistaken about dates. In the court's opinion, I think that the defence is entitled to some consideration in the form of having an adequate opportunity to prepare for the cross-examine the witness about the statements that was made today. I don't believe, first of all, there was a strictly speaking a violation and secondly, given the nature of the testimony, that the statement was made in jest. It would not raise to the level of something that would warrant the granting of a mistrial. The court would be inclined to grant the defence the opportunity, first of all, to cross-examine the witness in an attempt to attack the statement today. If the defence wishes, the court will also require the state to make the witness available for the defence to consult at a later date. If the defence feels it needs additional time in which to prepare to cross-examine the witness on this issue, the court may also consider giving an instruction to the jury at some later point. If it is deemed to be warranted, but I think it's premature at this stage to speculate as to whether or not such an instruction may be required, or what the content of such an instruction might be. So I am giving the defence an alternative opportunity. You are free to cross-examine the witness today. You are free to also, if you cross-examine him today, to have him brought back at the later date, after you have had more time to digest the testament today, you can also postpone your cross-examination of the witness if you wish. I understand the court's rulings. Those are the three choices that present some complicated weighing for us to do. I guess, as a first step, what I would like to do is have 30 minutes or something to talk with Mr Buting about that. And I would like at this point the court to, until Mr Dassey has completed whatever testimony he's going to give in this case, I would like the court to order that the state and any agent of the state, including members of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department or either of the two lead investigators or anyone acting on their behalf, not discuss with Bobby Dassey any aspect of his testimony, have no contact with him about his testimony actually given already or anticipated further on direct or cross-examination. So in other words, I would like him sequestered. That agents of the state would include the district attorney's office, anyone involved on the prosecution side of the case or acting at the prosecution's direction. And I also will not talk to Mr. Dassey either without approaching the court and telling the court and counsel that we intend or we are asking to be able to interview him while his testimony is ongoing in the sense that he has not been released from his appearance here. But I would like to, at a minimum, to freeze the frame, so to speak, where it is. And to start with, like I said, I think 30 minutes for Mr. Buting and I to talk about which of the three options the court has offered us immediately, we best should choose in representing Stephen Avery. Mr. Kratz. I do have a suggestion, Judge. My direct examination of Bobby, as the court may have already predicted, will be concluded with Bobby identifying the balance of the photos that are in front of him. I don't intend to ask him any other questions. That seems to be <clears throat> seamless enough that it will allow Mr. Strang an opportunity over the lunch hour. Perhaps the court could even grant a little extension over the lunch hour for the defense to discuss their strategy so the jury could at least hear the rest of the direct testimony 
which is just the identification of the other photographs and exhibits. I think that would be fair for Mr. Strang to give him an opportunity to discuss that. Well, if it's really just finishing identifying the photographs and there is no summary or wind up at the end, then that is a reasonable suggestion. I think we could. If I could get 90 minutes for lunch today, Mr. Buting and I could incorporate the discussion. I'm suggesting we need to have over the lunch hour. So I don't have any quarrel if I understand Bobby Dassey really does end on direct examination when the last photograph is identified and explained. Council has just reminded me, Judge, that if during the course of Bobby's identification of some photographs, he says something, I may ask a clarifying question that may raise some areas of inquiry. So, although my intent is to ask about these photographs and what is depicted in them, it's possible that it could go into other areas of information on the property and like, but I don't envision, certainly don't envision revisiting this statement issue. But I was just trying to come up with a suggestion that could at least complete the direct examination before lunch. Perhaps it would be useful to know, Your Honour, how many photographs we have left to go and about what time the prosecution expects that its continued direct examination will, will consume. Mr. Kratz. I think we have 20 pictures left, Judge. I think the questions will be what you heard so far is what we are looking at. Why don't we finish up on that and take a lunch break at this point? And I do. I think I would like a ruling about, I know I would like a ruling on my request that Mr. Dassey, at this point, until a further order of the court, not be questioned in any way by any agent of the state. He will have to have some incidental contact with Julie Leverance, who is the victim witness coordinator from the Calumet County District Attorney's Office. I don't have any practical objection to that. When does he need to be back, or whatever? Any objection from the state? No. All right. The court will order that no attorney or representative either side have any contact with Mr. Darcy until the testimony is completed, and the victim witness coordinator is not to discuss any aspect of his testimony with him. With that, I believe we can bring the jury back in and complete the direct examination of Mr. Darcy. The record should reflect that I have instructed the victim witness coordinator as to what to do. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. Bobby, we left off on Exhibit 56 that was in front of you. I think you started to tell us what Exhibit 56 was. Can you tell us again, please? That is my grandma's house. Now that the jury can see Exhibit 56, where is your grandma's house? located in relationship to you to the east okay we will see an overview or at least the jury has but how far down that road is your grandma's trailer located do you know uh, maybe six tenths of a mile and then they have a road or more of a long driveway is that correct yes it is a long driveway the next exhibit is number 57. Can you tell us what that is, please? It's another uh, another picture of uh, my grandma's house. From a different angle? Yes. And again, now that the jury can see exhibit number 57, how are we looking at her trailer? That would be, if you were coming into the driveway, that would be the east side of it, uh, the northeast side of it. So, if you are coming from the main road on Highway 147, you are coming toward the end of it? Yes, that would be the front. What is the next exhibit, Exhibit 58? That is the office area inside the shop uh, of the salvage yard. Now, as I get that picture up, if I can, in fact, do that. You are talking about the shop? 
where they do all their business, where they fix the cars. On the Avery Savage property, this is other than just residences, is that correct? Yes. Do you know how many other buildings there are other than residences? Three. Exhibit number 58, is that one of them? Yes. The main office area, if somebody did business with the Savage Place, he would come into this room here? Yes. All right. Tell us what Exhibit 59 is. Uh, just another picture of the Plymouth Voyager van. Now, Exhibit 59, where was that taken from? Do you know? From the driveway. Do you still have the laser pointer up there? Yes. Can you show us with the laser pointer where your mother's and your home would be located in relationship to this picture? It would be on this side of the picture. The left side? Yes. And that is the maroon fan again. The van that you saw Teresa taking pictures of? Yes. Objection. Asked and answered. The testimony is getting cumulative, Your Honor. Mr. Cross. Judge, although I understand I have asked the questions, these are all different angles. It will have a use later in the trial. I suspect with this picture, that is self-explanatory. I will allow one question to put the picture into context. That was the vehicle that Teresa was taking a picture of? Yes. All right. The next exhibit is exhibit number 60. That is another picture of the van, just a different angle. What we are showing on the screen is exhibit 60. Objection. Cumulative and waste of time under section 904.03. Are you referring to the description of the photo or the photo itself? The photo and the description of it. It's my understanding at this time we are going through these photos because they may be used later. It's a bit difficult for the court to say in advance that a photo may be a waste of time since I don't know the purpose for which it may be used. So I'm not going to rule on that objection for now. All right. Exhibit 61. Another picture of the van at a different angle. What is in the background of Exhibit 61? My mom's house. When looking at Exhibit 61, could you again point out the picture or, excuse me, the window that you looked out and watched things from? It would be that window uh, there. The leftmost window on the trailer, is that correct? Yes. Exhibit 62 is the front of, what is that? That would be Stephen's car. What kind of car is that? Pontiac Grand Am. You mentioned that Stephen had a truck as well. Yes. We saw that in a previous picture. Is that correct? Yes. This blue car, that Grand Am, is obviously a different vehicle. Did Stephen drive this car? Oh, yes. What is Exhibit 63? Uh, that would be the yard's flatbed. The salvage yard flatbed. What is a flatbed? For those of us who don't know. For hauling cars, for picking up cars. Your Honour, I would like to be heard briefly at sidebar, if I may. Very well. What is the next picture of, in front of you, Exhibit 64? That would be my grandma's golf cart. Your grandma's what? Golf cart. And again, on the large screen, that is a representation of the photo that is in front of you? Yes. 
Do you know where that golf cart was normally kept? In her garage. What is Exhibit 65? My mom's golf cart. Again, directing your attention to the large screen. Where was that normally kept? Uh, mostly outside. Outside of what? Our house. The next photo is Exhibit 66. Can you tell us what that is? That would be the car crusher. Where on the property was that located? Do you know? Down, down in the pit. What does down in the pit mean? It would actually be on the east side of the pit, the far side. The east side of the property? Yes. Bubby? Did you ever operate this piece of equipment? No. Okay. I think he had this on a couple of different angles. But can you tell us about Exhibit 67? Uh, just a front view of the car crusher again. Actually, I am not even going to post these to the jury. Just tell me what it is. Uh, just a front view of the crusher. And 68. A back view of the crusher. And exhibit 69. A picture of the whole background. Of the pit that you were talking about? Yes. Okay. I will show this one. Tell us what we were looking at here. Uh, this is the far east side of the property. Can you show us with the laser pointer the crusher, please? Uh, the crusher is right there. Is there a body of water or a pond right there? Yes, that would be uh, right around there. Now, do you know what is on the other side of that pond? Uh, just an embankment. Are there vehicles on the other side? Uh, there is a little lower and there is a, an embankment. Could you show us that with your laser pointer, what you're talking about? There is the embankment and there is uh, the road that runs uh, this side of the pond. Okay. What is Exhibit 70? Crushed cars. Have you seen any crushed cars on the property? No. You were not involved in the business at all? No. What is the next picture, number 71? A picture of tires. And what are picture 71, the tires? Or where were they located? Just north of the crusher. What is exhibit 72? A pile of tires. Do you know where those tires were located? That is just southwest of Stevens Trailer uh, in the back corner. Exhibit 73. What is that? Just the Avery Salvage sign. Where was that sign located? Now that the jury is seeing it on Exhibit 73. At the end of Avery's Road. What does Avery Road connect with? Highway 147. So, this sign that is on Exhibit 73 would be at that intersection? Is that correct? Yep. The next exhibit is Exhibit 74. What is that? Just an overview of the salvage yard. Can you describe that any further? Directly south from Stevens Trailer. I think this will be the last picture I will show. There are some others up there. All right. Exhibit 74. What are you looking at? This is maybe half of the salvage yard uh, with cars. Those vehicles are located throughout the salvage property? Yes. And, in fact, what is Exhibit 75? More pictures of cars in the junkyard. And Exhibit 76. Uh, just another picture of an overview of the yard. 
and 77. Uh, the same thing, another picture of the overview. More junk cars. Yep. More junk cars. Finally, Exhibit 78 in front of you. More junk cars. With that, Judge, I will move admission of Exhibits 37 through 78, as identified by Mr. Dassey. Mr. Strain. Number 70, I think he said he has never seen these crushed cars before. So I don't think that we even got to the relevancy of number 70. I think many of the others are cumulative. But as a practical matter, some of that we can address later. I don't have any questions about their authenticity. All right. The court will at this time allow the exhibit and except for Exhibit 7A based upon laying a foundation. Mr. Kratz, do you have any further questions for this witness? No, not at this time, Judge. All right, members of a jury, counsel, and I have a few things to take up before we continue. So we're going to take a break at this time, early for lunch, and resume at one o'clock. Again, I will remind you not to discuss the case in any fashion during the break. You may be seated. We are now outside the presence of the jury. Mr Strang, you requested a brief sidebar during the witness testimony. Did you wish to put that on the record? Yes, I do. We had two photographs identified and published to the jury. These were, by my notes, numbers 22 and 63, in which obvious police crime scene evidence yellow tape is wrapped around first what was identified as Mr. Avery's Grand Am, and secondly, the witness identified a flatbed truck. The implication of the evidence tape, obviously, is that there's something of evidentiary value in culpatory, presumably, since the state is offering these, and it appears to be police tape. That is an unfair implication as to both the Grand Am and the flatbed truck. I cannot imagine what the probative value of the photographs of these two vehicles is. In any event, certainly the state has photographs of the Grand Am without evidence, tape, or other suggestions there is something to be preserved or something incriminating or inculpatory about it. So I think those ought not to come in for those reasons. That is a much longer version of what I said at the sidebar but that was the issue I was raising at sidebar off the record. And I will note that although I am aware under state versus Minerio, M-I-N-I-E-R-O and other cases, the appellate courts of the state are not found at all of off the record sidebars. I'm the one who requested the sidebar and I know that it would be off the record. So, I will try to make it clear what I think I said, and the sidebar then immediately has to be on the record, but I appreciate the court giving me a chance now to elaborate much further on the issue I raised in summary at sidebar. All right, I will say the court is aware we have been admonished by the appeals courts to avoid sidebars whenever possible, and whenever one is held to make a record of it. I try to remember to do that as best I can, Mr. Kratz. Any response to the defence concern about the two exhibits? Just briefly, Judge. Those items were, in fact, as soon as both of them were inspected, one of them, the blue Pontiac, was processed, and the items therein tested by the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory, and a DNA profile was developed from within. The fact that Stephen Avery's blood is near the console of that vehicle as well as in Ms. Havok's vehicle, the state intends to include in evidence in this case. Especially if the defense intends to pursue their planting of Mr. Avery's blood evidence, and the court, I'm sure, on its own, can surmise the arguments that the state may make if, in fact, planting evidence is going to continue to be advanced in this case. The negative evidence, that is, 
The lack of evidence in the flatbed has similar evidentiary value. And whether the state intends to argue directly the implication of negative evidence or just the fact that the state looked, the fact that the state, in fact, did a thorough investigation, all has at least some relevance in this case. And the showing of these two photographs are not, in and of themselves, prejudicial. They will be both referred to later in this trial. And at this time, I think it's proper for the court to not reject or exclude those photographs as exhibits. Thank you. All right. I'm satisfied that at least for this stage of the trial, both of the photos offered have at least the potential for prohibitive value. For the reasons stated, among other things, the thoroughness of the state's investigation can be put into play later this case. I do have one question, however. Does the state have photos of either the Pontiac Grand Dam or the flatbed that doesn't have evidence tape involved? I can check, Judge. I don't know that we have the flatbed. The Grand Dam, we may have photos at the crime lab, and that is something that I can certainly inquire into. But these were the first photos. I don't know that evidence tape in and of themselves since the jury will hear they were processed, is anything prejudicial at all. But I will check for the court. All right, let's have the parties report back at one o'clock. Then the first order of business will be hearing from the defence. Yeah, I would like a little more than one time than one o'clock. If I could get 90 minutes, I think that would be enough. All right, we will give you until one fifteen. Okay. You may be seated. At this time, we're back on the record, outside the presence of the jury. I will indicate for the record that I met with counsel briefly in chamber before we began. It is my understanding, I believe, that we have an agreement on how we are going to proceed at this afternoon. And that involves specifically taking a witness out of order. Is that correct, counsel? The state understands, Your Honour, that the defence has asked for an opportunity <clears throat> to defer its cross-examination of Bobby Dassey until the beginning of court tomorrow, we understand that the state, <clears throat> excuse me, the defense, wishes an opportunity to interview Mr. Dassey sometime yet this afternoon, and the state is prepared to call Trooper Austin, and we have him present and have him present his testimony before the cross-examination begins which, as I understand, the defense has asked for leave to commence that tomorrow morning. Mr. Strain. I had suggested in chambers that our conclusion and the defense's statement was that we did, not, we did need to interview Bobby Dassey before cross-examining him and that we wished to cross-examine him only once so as not to draw undue attention to him or to any part of his testimony. Because that is an interview that is of unpredictable length and will take us in different possible directions, some of which I can predict as possibilities, and I'm not sure I can predict all of the possibilities, I had asked that we have the balance of the day to do that and that we start tomorrow morning with the cross-examination of Bobby Dassey so that for the jury, this just flows sequentially and, you know, the fact that the court had to resolve some issues is all the jury would know. In chambers, as I understood the court, it was unwilling to un adjourn for the afternoon and start up again tomorrow morning. I object to taking another witness out of order because I expect that, as I understand this trial, then Bobby Dassey will be the only witness whose cross-examination did not immediately follow in order with his direct examination. That is, it was broken up by another witness. The court, of course, controls the mode and the order of the interrogation of witnesses. But this does tend to highlight him, and also it leaves us attending to true Austin, which that time probably would be better used and should be used in interviewing Bobby Dassey and adjusting the cross-examination of Bobby Dassey. Accordingly, doing a one and a half 
or one hour witness is better than having no time to interview Bobby Dassey at all, to be sure. But I don't think this is an adequate remedy, and as I forecasted in Chambers and won't repeat here, there are a number of possible possible issues that we may need to visit or revisit, depending on the results of the conversation with Bobby Dassey. But in any event, I do ask the court then to exempt us or to carve an exemption for Mr. Buting and myself and our defence investigator this afternoon so that we can talk to Bobby Dassey here during the midst of his testimony, so to speak. But we would ask that the court's earlier order remain in place for agents of the state other than Miss Leverens, who, of course, as a practical matter, has to have some communication with Bobby Dassey about the court's schedule and plans. Mr. Cross. Thank you, Judge. As the court knows, in chambers, it was the state's request that the defense proceed directly with cross-examination. I will have an exhibit marked for the court, which I alerted the court and reminded counsel that they already had in their position pages 516 and 517 of the Sheriff's Department discovery which is now a second place within the material that Mr. Strang already had, which alerted the defense counsel to the substance of, and the surrounding circumstances of the interview that Mr. Dassey mentioned in his direct testimony. To suggest to this court at this time that it was not until this very moment that the defense realized the significance of Bobby Dassey when they had known for well over a year that Bobby Dassey was the last person, other than their client, to see Ms. Habak alive and walking toward Mr. Avery's trailer, to suggest it's only now that they believe it important to interview Bobby Dassey, the state believes to be disingenuous. That notwithstanding, Your Honor, we understand why the defense has made this request. We do disagree that after Mr. Strang and Mr. Buting have an opportunity to interview Mr. Dassey, that the state should somehow be prohibited or pre precluded from ourselves interviewing or speaking with Mr. Dassey. That is a separate issue, of course. And with that exhibit now having been provided to the court, we don't believe that we have any further need to make any further record on this issue. Thank you, Judge. I acknowledge that I have had in my possession pages 516 and 517 of the Calumet County Sheriff's Department report. It's not well over a year, of course, because Mr. Buting and I have first entered our appearances less than a year ago in this case. But we have had those, that report, and those two pages for months. And in any event, I wish that the question of the interviewing of Bobby Dassey were as easy as whether he is important or not. That is not the question. There are a whole lot of other dynamics at work here, such as the availability of witnesses and the allocation of resources and some of those things. We don't need to rehash all of the arguments about why the defence had wanted a trial date later than February 5, 2007, but it's not all that easy. I can say and should say that we have not interviewed Bobby Dassey at any time and we hope to be able to do that today. And the issue, in the end, I think under section 971.231b comes down to the meaning of witness and whether here we were provided with notice by the state that Bobby Dassey will be a witness to testify to the oral statement at issue, materially different as it is from Mr. Osmondson's rendition, and some differences from the second-hand rendition from another witness in pages 516 and 517, in just recounting to a law enforcement agent what Bobby Dassey supposedly said to him about what Stephen Avery said in Bobby Dassey's presence. So I think we have got a record. I have made, and I will renew the mistrial motion and the request for lesser relief 
with the least favoured alternative being given the afternoon here to attend just to Bobby Dassey and resume in the trial with the jury tomorrow morning with Bobby Dassey's cross-examination. I understand the court has ruled on that. I just wanted to make our position clear. All right. First of all, the court ha has already denied the motion for a mistrial and I have read nothing to make me change that. Since the matter was brought up on the record this morning, the state has presented the court with another piece of discovery, which makes reference a little more directly to the statement that was the subject of the defence motion here. Given the fact, nevertheless, that the witness himself in his own statements apparently did not make reference to the information contained in the other do two documents that highlighted the witness exposure to this alleged statement on the part of the defendant, I agree the defendant should be permitted some time to explore this issue and to interview the witness. I have not been presented a reason why such an interview should require hours of preparation. Since the defence has had the opportunity to interview the witness for as long as the case has been pending. There is only one narrow issue, specifically the witness testimony, as to one statement on the part of the defendant that gives rise to the need for another interview. I am confident if we break a little earlier today and the defence has the opportunity to interview the witness, that should be su sufficient to address any problem that may exist. I do agree under the circumstances that the defence should have the right to interview Mr Darcy first, but under the circumstances I see no reason to prohibit any representative of the state from interviewing Mr Darcy later. Again, for those reasons I have been stated earlier, we are talking about one fairly narrow statement here that is referenced in at least two different spots in the discovery that was admittedly provided to the defence. I think the remedy the court has ordered should be sufficient to address this issue. Likewise, I don't believe the court will simply inform the jury for the convenience of the parties and the witnesses we are going to hear from Officer Austin and the cross-examination of Mr Darcy will be completed tomorrow morning. That happens on a fairly routine basis in many trials for a variety of reasons and the court has never known that to be something that is likely to influence a jury in any way. So at this time, we will bring the jurors back in, and Mr Kratz, you can call your witness. Thank you. What was the exhibit number? Page 516 and 517? Exhibit 89. Okay. Don't we have another issue? There is another issue that I will take up tomorrow morning. I don't believe it will cry to be taken up now. Okay. Judge, regarding Mr. Austin, I told the court that Mr. Austin intends to explain his process through a PowerPoint demonstration, which, after work concluded, I will mark and make part of the record. I do have a hard copy for the court to follow along. I have provided Mr. Buting and Mr. Strang with a copy as well, so they can follow along. And finally, as I alerted the court later in the trial, some of these computer images may be, in fact, referred to in a small subset of these images. I also have some four by six images made to complete the record. I will provide those and have those marked as well to be identified by this witness at the conclusion of his testimony. But I will give the court and the clerk the exhibits here, and the court can follow along with the PowerPoint demonstration as well. We are prepared to proceed then. Very well. You may be seated. Members of a jury, for reasons relating to the availability of witnesses, we are going to take a witness out of order at this time. The defence will be conducting its cross-examination of Mr Darcy tomorrow morning, and the state is going to call another witness at this time. Mr. Cross. We will call Trooper Tim Austin at this time. State your full name and spell your last name, please. My name is Timothy Austin, A-U-S-T-I-N. Mr. Austin, how are you employed? I'm employed as a trooper with the Wisconsin State Patrol. 
I'm assigned to the Wisconsin State Patrol Academy to the Technical Reconstruction Unit. Can you tell us what the Technical Reconstruction Unit is? The Technical Reconstruction Unit, it's a specialized unit, if you will, of persons that work with crash reconstructions and crime scene reconstructions for the division of the State Patrol. Could you briefly set forth your education, training, and experience in the areas of scene modeling? Yes, sir. I've been trained and certified as an instructor in the field of forensic diagramming, which includes the use of computer-aided drafting or drawing software and a, ge a geodometer which is basically an electronic surveying device for collecting measurements. Trooper Austin, we will be referring to the large screen here in the courtroom. This is what is known as a PowerPoint presentation or PC presentation software. Could you, first of all, just tell the jury what we will be looking at during your testimony and how this was created? Yes. To assist with my testimony, under, under the direction of Mr. Kratz, I created a PowerPoint presentation. What you will see is a series of slides that will help to bring us through the forensic mapping project that I did in this particular case. You'll see some images in two dimensions and some three-dimensional computer scenes that I generated. All right. What is forensic mapping? Forensic mapping is, a, is the science, if you will, of collecting measurements at a crash or crime scene and then putting them together later in either a two-dimensional diagram or a three-dimensional model. Such was my objective in this particular case to collect measurements at the given property and later to bring those measurements into the office to create uh, two-dimensional diagrams and some three-dimensional models. Now, specifically, Trooper Austin, on November 5th of 2005, were you asked to proceed to, and did you, in fact, Proceed to a property known as the Avery Salvage Yard. Yes. On November 5th of 2005, I was requested by local law enforcement to go to the Avery property in Manitowoc County for the purpose of forensic mapping. How long were you at that property? The forensic, the forensic mapping activities went from November 5th through November 12th of that year. You mentioned, I think, earlier that this forensic mapping process requires the taking of measurements. Can you describe that process and how many measurements were involved? Yes. As I said before, we utilized an electronic measuring device in addition to recording some measurements by hand with tape measures, if you will. But the bulk of the measurements were taken using an electronic device known as the geodimeter, the, that is G-E-O-D-I-M-E-T-E-R, or the total station. In total, we documented over 4,100 measurements at the Avery property. Tell us about the total station process, please. Certainly. The total station, as I said before, is an electronic device composed of an electronic distance measuring system, which essentially measures distance distance from the total station to a given evidentiary point. It also has a theodolite, which measures angles. It also has a data collector and a prism. Just for the record, 
and for the reporter's benefit. A hard copy of this will be provided for the spellings of everything you said. That is a picture of the geodimeter. Is that correct? Yes. And those other devices that are used to create these measurements are included within the total station package itself. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Hence the name total station. It measures not just angles like a transit would. It also measures distance. And that's, that is because we have a, theolo, a theodolite and a distance measuring system in there. We have a total package or hence a total station. I'm sure Mr. Platowski would like you to slow down just a little more. That would be terrific. Can you tell us about the information storage and retrieval? Certainly. Again, what the total station does is measures the distance and angles to a particular location. For example, if I were measuring an item of evidentiary value where Mr. Kratz is, I would ask him to hold the prism over that item of evidentiary value. The total station would recognize the angle to Mr. Kratz both horizontally and vertically. It would then measure the distance. What it will document is that particular point's location in 3D space. In other words, along an x-axis, a y-axis, and a z-axis, based on where the total station is located. If there is another point on the other side of the courtroom, it would do the same thing distance and angle to that particular point. It stores that data in an onboard data collector, which you see in the lower pictures. Is that basically a computer? Yes, it is. And it does convert these horizontal and vertical angles to X, Y, and Z coordinates for later retrieval. All right. Let's talk about the total station's accuracy. Can you tell the judge just how accurate is this process? This particular total station has a maximum angular error or induced error from instruments of three seconds. So what that means, as I said before, it measures in angles. If I take a circle, that circle is divided into 360 degrees. Each degree is divided into 60 minutes. Each minute is divided into 60 seconds. So this particular instrument is accurate to within three of those seconds. Mr. Kratz, at this particular scene, the longest shot distance was about 1,200 feet. If I calculate it out mathematically, that means our maximum error induced by the instrument is less than a half inch. All right. Let's talk about the location, the Avery Savage property itself. I have put your next slide on the screen and feel free to use the laser pointer or whatever you may need to explain or describe this for the jury. Please, the mapping locations. In this slide, I put an aerial photograph of the Avery property. The purpose of this was to show that we had actually forensically mapped out this entire location. That is, everything that you see here on the screen was mapped out using that geodimeter total station. This second slide, Mr. Kratz shows us a different view, another aerial photograph of the same property. This time we have changed it so north is to the left side of the screen, and in the box is where it shows the Avery Salvage property. That map was created, and I put this slide up because in addition to mapping the Avery Salvage property, 
We also completed some forensic mapping at what is best described as the deer camp. I was not privy as to who owns the deer camp. I know it's an unrelated person. We did forensic mapping at this location too, and also a cul-de-sac at the end of Tufts Road. The areas we mapped were somewhat considerable in terms of geographic location, if you will. Are you familiar with a term called CAD drawing? Yes, sir. From a two-dimensional standpoint, describe that for the jury, please. What Mr. Kratz is referring to as CAD is computer-aided drawing. In addition, we are doing all of our diagramming on the computer, and we refer to two-dimensional drawings. What that is is an orthogonal view, meaning looking from the top straight down. That is how most of the Avery property was diagrammed so that when you look at the computer drawing, it's essentially as if you were way above the scene looking straight down at it. What that allows you to do is take specific locations and <laughs> zoom in on it, if you will, to look at those locations in detail. Let's look at some of the two-dimensional drawings. What are we looking at now? By the way, Chad, I will, as we go through this, I will refer to the hard copy. This will be the bottom page of, of page seven, just so the record is clear as this witness testifies. Go ahead, Mr. Austin. What we are looking at here is that two-dimensional CAD drawing that was created showing the Avery property that we saw in the aerial photographs. And again, we have the ability to zoom in on specific areas if we wanted to see the details of a different location in that entire overall salvage property. Were you able, with your total station measuring, are you able to tell the jury the perimeter, if you will, in distances? Yes, not directly with the total station, Mr. Kratz. However, once we bring it into the computer environment, we can take measurements to be able to determine the extent of that. In this case here, I want to say the rough measurements, because the property is not perfectly square, but north and south, the measurement is approximately 1,260 feet, and east and west, the measurement is approximately 1,300 feet. That comes out to be just under 40 acres. All right. Let's talk about some of the two-dimensional views that you created then. This image, again, which would be on the bottom of page 8, is the entire Avery property. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And I will put this image back in here again to show you that we're going to zoom in, if you will, on certain sections on those two-dimensional diagrams. So with this portion of that drawing, we are now going to look at the two-dimensional drawing, which shows the northeast corner of the property. In that northeast corner of the property are the business buildings, if you will, for the Avery salvage yard. What we are looking at here, sir, there are blue colored buildings down here, is the main business or main shop. There are also some other storage locations. This would be private residences located over here. Were you also asked to do a two-dimensional view of where Teresa Halbach's vehicle was located? Yes. The scene we were just at was at the northeast corner. We are now going to go down where you see a yellow box to the southeastern corner of the property. The very first night of forensic mapping, the RAV4 was there. 
Therefore, we did forensically map its location and a two-dimensional diagram was generated. And we can zoom in on that area on the two-dimensional diagram to see that location. Then, on the top of page 11 now, the screen that the jury is viewing, why don't you tell us what we're looking at? What we're looking at here are details of that southeastern corner of the property. And what we see here is the RAV4 that Mr. Kratz has asked me about positioned here. Now, we did actually, using the total station, locate pieces of wood or other debris that was leaning up against or on top of the vehicle. That is why you see in this two-dimensional drawing, there are some items on that view of the car. Were you asked to determine the location and the distance between the RAV4 and a fixed object, which is known as a car crusher? Yes. To assist with that, I will put the aerial photo back on to, again, show that. The RAV4 was located down there in this location. And the vehicle crusher is located where you now see the yellow square. If you look at the CAD drawing of this, we can see where the vehicle crusher is, is, relate, is related to the position of the RAV4. Now, if you take a direct as the crow flies measurement, if you will, from the RAV4 straight across, and there is a pond area here, but straight across to the vehicle crusher is about 380 feet away. Again, for the jury, when you say about 380 feet away, you can actually tell them within a half inch how far away that is, can't you? If you were to ask me, Mr. Kratz, specific locations, say this spot on the RAV4 to this spot on the crusher, we could get very accurate. I rounded this off to the nearest foot just because I'm, I'm taking an approximate position on the RAV4 to an arbitrary position on the vehicle crusher. Also asked to do two-dimensional views of the area closer to Stephen Avery's residence itself. Yes, sir. Mr. Kratz, if, if, if we move from the vehicle crusher here, to the northwestern area of the salvage yard, there are two private residences in that area, one belonging to Mr. Avery, and we can, again, on the two-dimensional drawing, zoom in, if you will, as this location to view a scaled scenic representation of that area. On the top of page 14, then, is our first two-dimensional view. Why don't you show us what you're looking at? Again, the northwestern portion of that property, what we are seeing here is a private residence. This would be Mr. Avery's residence. There is a garage next to it, and a little further east is another private residence and garage. I think you may have testified, just in passing, but so the jury understands. Were you personally involved in taking all of these measurements? Yes, sir. How many measurements did you take? For the Avery salvage property, there were over 4,100 measurements that were documented. How long were you there? How many days? It would be November 5th through the 12th, about a week. This slide, Mr. Kratz, shows that two-dimensional CAD drawing of the Avery salvage yard. And I have highlighted or labeled, if you will, these areas that we just saw details of. The location of the RAV4 in the southeastern corner, the vehicle crusher, 
the business office we saw first in the northeastern corner and in the northwest, this is Mr. Avery's residence. Were you asked to determine some distances for us? Yes, I was asked to determine some general distances. Again, as we saw earlier, these are point to point measurements. They do not account for the fact that we could not really walk from the business office to the RAV4. There are some obstructions in there. But if you took a direct measurement, you would see it's, a, it's almost 1,100 feet from the RAV4 to the business office. I will just move forward a couple of slides because the last slide, the slide on the bottom of page 16, shows all of those measurements. Why don't you go ahead, Mr. Austin, and tell us what all those measurements are? Yes, sir. The other measurements I added on here, like the distance from the RAV4 to Mr. Avery's residence, again, straight across the property, is approximately 1,480 feet. The distance back from Mr. Avery's residence to the business office is about 1,100 feet. For the final measurement, what I did is take the driving distance, if you will. If we were to go from Mr. Avery's residence, drive around and come around from the eastern portion of the property down to the RAV4 location would be about 2,600 feet of distance. I've added, I, I have to add Mr. Kratz, this doesn't account for changes in grade. In other words, the Avery property is not just a flat surface. There are some elevations in there. That doesn't account for traveling down a hill or traveling up a hill. So the actual distance might be slightly greater than 2,600 feet. How far is that in miles? Well, a mile is 5,280 feet, so this would be close to a half mile. These two-dimensional views, the charts or the diagrams, if you will, have been used in trials. But, you, but are you able, with this software, are you able, <clears throat> with your training and experience, to convert these measurements? and to convert these two-dimensional images into more three-dimensional scenes or models? Yes. As I mentioned before, the total station actually records measurements in 3D space. That is, not just our flat X or Y axis, but also a Z axis, up and down. So we can come up with the elevations or the height of specific objects which was done in this case using a different software package. Let's talk about that software. The software package utilized is known as Forensic 3D. It's a computer-aided drawing program. It's powered by a CAD engine called Rhinoceros. It's typically used in the marine industry and the jewelry design industry. What this does is allows a user to actually draw in 3D space. With the three-dimensional drawings, it allows us to better understand, as I wrote up here, the spatial and geometrical relationships between objects. In other words, we are not just looking straight down. And it's something where we can examine other vantage point or perspective. So the jury understands eventually where we are going. I know I'm fast forwarding and we will get there, but will this allow us to go through an animation to actually do a tour or walk through of various locations? 
Yes, as we work our way through enough of the slides I have here, we will eventually get to using the software to create an animation or walkthrough, if you will, of the physical scene. All right, let's talk about assigning texture maps. With the software package, the user utilizes a process called texture mapping to create a drawing like the one you see here. What this means is if I create a three dimensional model from this software, I can apply a texture to that to make it more realistic looking, if you will. In this case, for example, what was done is a photograph was taken of the siding of Mr. Avery's residence. Using that photograph on the siding, it was pasted onto a three dimensional model so that actual siding is what you see in this model that was rendered. Now, when we look at things such as grass or wood that was taken from a personal library that I had, if you will, that way I can make something look similar to grass or look similar to wood. But there are certain aspects of this property that the texture mapping was done by using the actual photographs that we had on the siding of the residence, the siding of the garage, the floor in the bathroom, and the floor in the bedroom. All right. What areas were you asked to do three-dimensional modeling in? Although the entire property, again, was forensically mapped, the three-dimensional modeling was done in the northwestern area, as that area is the area of the two residences that we have discussed earlier. The first scene model is from the bottom of page 19. Why don't you walk us through this briefly? What we're looking at here is an overview of the entire area that was done in three dimensions. For what we are seeing here, north would be to the bottom of the image. In other words, we're looking to the south. And on the right-hand side, we see Mr. Avery's residence. We see the garage next to that. And we have to talk about these other residences too, private residences here, and then the garage and the vehicles and the other items that were in place when the forensic mapping was completed. You talked about Mr. Avery's residence, and I think you also mentioned this residence. Do you know what that is? This residence that we are seeing on the left side of the screen, which would be to the east, is the residence of, I believe, Barb Yonda and Mr. Dassey. Here we have that previous slide that we showed with a box around that. And next we have essentially zoomed in, if you will, or moved closer to get a close up view of that Yonda Dassey residence. Is this view the front of that residence? Yes, this would be the front of that residence. Again, we are at north looking south. What is nice about using the forensic or three-dimensional models here, we can actually take that and go around to view the back side. We're not limited just to certain views of this location. Let me ask you, Trooper Austin, the advantage, recognizing it's not a photograph, but is the advantage of incident scene mapping that it does allow perspective or views that perhaps the naked eye can't see? Yes, the first part of the question is very important. These are not photographs. These are, again, scene models that were created and compiled based on the measurements taken at the scene. But where they are advantageous, we can change the views and change the perspective. This one, for example, I don't know how high up the camera is in the air, probably somewhere around 50 to 75 feet. 
But obviously, it's not a view that I could take or obtain from being out there at the scene. What are we looking at now? As I stated before, with these models, we can actually change our location to gain a different perspective. In this case, we move behind the Yonda Dassey residence just to get a good look at the back side of that house to see the geometric relationships of objects there. We are talking about the Yonda property. Were you also asked to do a scene model for the Avery property and what is called the curtilage, the area around it as well? Yes, just as we did with the Yonda property, we can do the same thing with Mr. Avery's residence over on the west side. What you're seeing here is another view of the larger model. Where we are zooming in on Mr. Avery's residence. Just as we did previously, we can move around to the back side to view the spatial relationships there. So again, the advantage is that we can take any particular view or perspective we want to look at it and see that using the three-dimensional models. Now, these are exterior views, that is, on the outside of the property. Were you asked to, in effect, do the same process inside of the buildings? Yes, that is correct. Exterior models were created of Mr. Avery's residence and the garage next to it. It's the same process that I did for the exteriors. Most of the measurements that we talked about were taken inside the residence. What I can do with this software is actually go in closer on that residence, fade in or out, or remove the roof so that we can see all of the various rooms inside the residence. Again, it's a view that we could not have through normal photographs of the buildings. At the bottom of page 24, the first interior scene model, why don't you tell us what we're looking at? This particular model shows Mr. Avery's residence. And again, what we've done here, the roof was hidden which allows us to gain a perspective of how the house is laid out, where these various rooms are in relationship to each other, and where some of the main pieces of furniture that were measured are located. Are you able, and can you, in fact, take specific rooms and give us a better view of a particular room? Yes. Actually, all of the rooms to one side, I had originally created images showing the interiors of the rooms. For example, in this case, we can look at the back bedroom, which you can see outlined here in yellow. We can zoom in closer for another angle to gain a perspective of how that particular room is laid out. What I'm showing you is the bottom of page 25. Is that the layout or more details of the images of Mr. Avery's master bedroom or what you called the back bedroom? Yes. However, I wouldn't say more details because it's the same model that we saw before. All we have done is changed our perspective, moved a little closer to see the objects that were placed in the room. It's not necessarily any more detailed. It's just that we have moved to a new perspective. We can now see the spatial relationships of the objects in that location. You said you were asked to do the same interior modeling with the garage. Can you tell us about that? Yes, sir. The exact same process was utilized with the garage. However, these measurements here were also documented using the total station. And when, and when this was mapped, we picked out the main or the larger items that were in the garage to place them into the model. And what you are seeing here 
is an overview of the garage with the roof removed. So we, we can see what is in that garage. On March 1st and 2nd of 2006, additional information was brought to your attention and the prosecution then, that is myself, Mr. Gahn and Mr. Fallon, asked you to include or create some additional images. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct, Mr. Kratz. Additional measurements were recorded by other law enforcement officers on March of 2006. And I was asked to include two of those evidentiary items in the scale model. And those items were denoted by what is described as being evidence markers. So to help show those locations using their measurements, I placed the evidence markers in the model so that we can see where those items were positioned. Now, so that the jury understands the latter use of these in the coming weeks, this image we are looking at from the bottom of page 27, although not a photograph, does provide, again, a perspective that the naked eye cannot see. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Kratz, because if you recall a few slides ago, as you showed what was in the garage, there was a Suzuki Samurai in this position and in the middle there is a snowmobile in this particular view. That Suzuki Samurai and the snowmobile were removed. That was done by me with the intention of being better able to view the locations of these items of evidentiary value. In addition, we see one marked as 23A. Previous to this slide, there was an air compressor over that particular location. To help to be able to see that location better, I hid or turned off, if you will, that air compressor. So you don't see it in this particular view. You have made a point before to distinguish between these models and photography. Your next slide attempts to describe that distinction a little bit further. Why don't you go ahead and do that? Yes, again, and in the previous question from Mr. Kratz, he asked me if these were photographs. They are not photographs. They should not be taken as being, being photographs. What they are, are three-dimensional models. All that a photograph is going to show you is the scene as it was observed when the picture was taken. In the models, what you are seeing is a scaled geometric perspective where we can remove the roof. We can hide the air compress compressor and gain different <coughs> views to better see particular items. All right. The next area I would like you to discuss is an area behind the garage of Mr. Avery's. Were you asked to provide some modeling of that? Yes, as we did with the two houses, you can take a particular area. In this case, you see again a yellow box showing an area behind the garage. We can essentially zoom in or change our perspective to see what some of the items are behind that garage. Again, this is an image, which is at the bottom of page 29. Do those include observations, not only that you made, but measurements that were involved in taking sometime between the 5th and the 12th of November? Yes, this particular slide shows some items behind Mr. Avery's garage that were based on measurements that were recorded by me or other observations. Now, you said you were able to kind of shift things around to get different perspectives. And the top of page 30 and 31 are examples of that. Is that correct? 
Yes, what we have done is essentially stayed in the same area, but we have shifted our camera, if you, if you will, or our position, so you can gain another perspective or another view of the items located behind the garage. Were you asked, Mr. Austin, to provide the jury with some perspective between the area behind Mr. Avery's garage and some of the backyard areas of the Yonda property? Yes, I actually moved over the location from that area uh, about behind the garage to this area behind the Yonda Dassey residence. Again, it was the same thing we have seen before. We can shift our perspective and our view to show this location behind that particular residence. This view here is one that it's an elevated view looking to the this 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 would be uh, the northwest. And we see not just the area behind the Yonda Dassey property, but also Mr. Avery's residence further into the image. Once again, were you asked to create the same separate angle, if you will, or separate perspective about what would be the north of Mr. Avery's property? Yes, if I move our focal point, if you will, to this particular location, that is being shown on this screen. We can gain yet another perspective showing the northern areas, if you will, the areas in front of Mr. Avery's residence. Can you show us, this is the top of page 33, what are we looking at here? What we are looking at is the view looking from north to southwest, and we see Mr. Avery's residence here and the garage that we looked up looked at previously up from the main portion of the image we are seeing a dodge caravan and there was also a burn barrel positioned over here finally trooper austin were you asked to provide some additional measurements in this quadrant or this area of the property Yes, I was asked to provide some measurements to gain an understanding of the distances here. What you are seeing in this view is that three-dimensional model. What we are, but we are looking straight down on it. Again, the original view is very similar to the two-dimensional drawings we saw previously, but this helps us to better show the measurements and the measurements that we have in here. Also, the distance from the main entrance of Mr. Avery's residence to the burn barrel. That is approximately 106 feet, and the measurements taken from the burn area behind the garage to some burn barrels behind the Yonda Dassey residence were a distance of about 236 feet. It's your understanding, or at least your directions came from the prosecution to explain or to indicate those measurements for the jury on this diagram. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. The last area of inquiry, Mr. Austin, has to do with skeletal models. Although they are clearly not within your area of expertise, and you will not be testifying about these models, would you tell the jury at least what you were asked to do and how this may come into play later in this trial? I was asked to assist the forensic anthropologist, Dr. Leslie Eisenberg, in the creation of models of a human skeleton to help identify the location of various bones. Now, to accomplish this, I met with Dr. Eisenberg and worked with her. 
directly under her supervision to create the models as to these bone locations. The initial skeletal model I obtained from the FBI in Quantico, Virginia, I took that model's texture and as I said before, with the property, I made it look more of a bony texture, if you will. And under Dr. Eisenberg's supervision again, I created various models showing that humans, showing uh, that human skeleton. And I saw some of the bones on it. Trooper Austin, as I have asked you before, and with the witnesses that will come after you that are going to be using your animation or, excuse me, your skeletal and scene models, have you been asked to create four by six prints of the models? Yes, I was asked to create that for most of the images that we saw on the PowerPoint to create four by six prints of these renditions, yes. The first image that I have for you is, I think, Exhibit 91. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And it goes through image, or excuse me, Exhibit 116? Yes, sir. Exhibit 91. If you can just take a moment through Exhibit 116. Are those the scene model images, both being included in your PowerPoint? and that you created as part of this total station project? Yes, sir. W with the exception of, there are several aerial photographs that were utilized in my initial report that are shown here. Those are not scene models. They are photographs taken from aircraft. Those are actually identical to some that were already received from other law enforcement. Is that your understanding? Yes, sir. I would move admission of it, exhibits 91 through 116. No objection. Those exhibits are admitted. Then, Trooper Austin, we are going to move on to your animation. That is the culmination of all of the scene models. Tell the jury, please, how this animation was created. The intention here was to create an overview or a walkthrough of the scene from the models that we saw previously. Now, to create motion, what we have is a series of these images. In fact, it shows 30 of them per second to show or to make it appear as if it were moving through that scene. To create the animation that I believe we're about to see, over 5,250 pictures were brought together at 30 per second to move us through the location in question. I saved these and made a DVD, which was turned over to Mr. Kratz. What we are going to show then, Drew Austin, is exhibit number 117 which I believe is the animation that you are referring to. I would ask that during the presentation of this animation that you not interrupt, that you remain silent, and I will ask you just a few follow-up questions after that. I understand. If I may, Judge, the only thing left in my direct examination was the playing of the animation. It appears that it won't play on this laptop. With my apologies to Mr. Strang, if he could begin his cross-examination, then if I could play it at the end, I would appreciate that. Otherwise, I have no further questions of this witness. Mr. Strang, are you in agreement with that procedure? Why are we playing the animation at all? Mr. Kratz, is that something that the state intends to use later in the trial? So, you need some foundation to get it accepted. This is actually, Judge, to assist the jury in understanding the relationship of these objects. I did intend to play it now. If you want to just take a couple of minutes for a break, we can certainly have that set up and I can play it now. 
I don't mind starting my cross. I think we'll see the animation later. We have had the foundation for it. I don't know that we need to play it now. I can begin my cross. Very well. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. I will turn my mic on. How is that? All right. So on November 5, you get to the Avery Salvage Yard, right? Yes, sir. And one of the first orders of business is to map the area around the Toyota RAV4. Yes, the first place we mapped was around the RAV4. All right. That involved taking the little prism and going up and putting that on or over certain objects around the Toyota. Yes, sir. Yes, that's correct. Did it also involve putting the little prism, sometimes sticking it in a certain area on the Toyota or over it directly? Over it directly, not directly on that particular item. Okay. And then somebody, somebody else stood somewhere else with the total station, as you call it, and it shined the little laser and bounced it back to the prism. Is that correct? Yes. And so this was a two-person process? Yes, it, it is a two-man operation. And you took a number of measurements around the Toyota? Yes. And objects around it? Yes. Then a number of measurements of the Toyota itself? The Toyota itself, we would have had four measurements. Just the four corners? No. When we mapped the location of vehicles, we utilized the position of the wheels. We can get data showing us later the exact size of a particular vehicle for Axis 1 and Axis 2. Okay. Then what you do is you later give the computer some information about the model of the vehicle. No, I will look up the, that somewhere else to get the dimensions. I'll use the dimensions to draw the vehicle. I don't tell the computer it's this particular vehicle and it draws it. I have to do a little research to get some information about that. Then the computer fills in a Toyota, in effect. Either I draw that or I use an existing Toyota and specify which items to fill in. There's a lot more manual work than there is that the computer does by itself. All right. The point is, what you are doing here is you have already said this, but let's explore it a little bit. There is no camera involved in any of this, correct? No. Not an old-fashioned camera or a digital camera? No camera. There are a couple of prisms and a laser? Yes. And you have a computer that calculates angles and distances? The total station does that. Then at your desktop, you probably have a, a laptop computer something sort of like this right yes i use a compu uh, computer and you can open various files and the computer allows you to add a color yes and a texture yes and to pick standard sorts of objects that might be included yes like a tree yes your computer even has a little file you can open up and pick up the type of tree you want that's correct whether it has leaves or does not have leaves i can pick the global season yes you can turn the sun on that's correct i can you can turn the sun off yes if you want to put the sun in the northern sky on november 5 or the northern hemisphere you can do that yes i could you could put it in the eastern sky if that is where you felt like putting it. Yes. You could have the sun rise in the west if that was your choice on a given day. Is that correct? If it was my intention to change science, yes, I could move the sun. Okay. So what we have got here is a model, right? Yes, a three-dimensional model, yes. 
actually it's a two-dimensional model right that looks three-dimensional by the use of perspective everything i saw was projected on this surface am i right well the screen yes is two-dimensional right the model itself looks three-dimensional by the use of perspective well it's not a physical model like the cups here i can't bring it into you it's a computer model but i'm drawing it in 3d space and assigning it to an x and y axis but i don't have a physical axis to give you in that sense it's not three-dimensional it's two-dimensional but by using the vanishing points and the principles of perspective we can give it the illusion of three-dimensional space on a flat screen it's difficult for me to follow you we do our work in 3d but you could say the same is true of photography that photography is two-dimensional sure if if that is what you are saying i will agree with you when you say you do your work in three dimensions you are not actually building a model in any event i mean that you didn't use something like this box for Bob Yander's trailer, I assume. No, it's not a physical stick built model, if you will, or plastic model. It's a virtual computer environment. Okay, got it. Now we are in the virtual environment. Let's go back to what you and I both agree is two dimensional space, okay? We will go to what you call your orthog orthogonal views. Got me? Sure. Orthogonal. Looking straight down, in other words. Yes. Orthogonal is a fancy $64 word for looking straight down at something. Yes. Okay. Now, you told us early on and actually showed us a pretty slide of the areas that you did more orthogonal mapping, forensic mapping of. First, we had the Avery Salvage property, right? Yes. Okay. And then we had, let's do it this way. I'm just going to take the piece of paper from your report. I'm going to put it on this gizmo. Then I will zoom it using viewing machine showing document on screen. Uh, okay. Now that is hard to see. But down at the bottom, do you see that area, hunting camp? yes that was an area you said you also mapped yes so there you could give us an overhead view yes sir okay now there were some other areas that you were, were also asked to map back on november 5th through november 12 2005 some other areas of the avery property true there were specific evidentiary spots that were mapped using a completely different instrument and not by me of those particular things that may have been of evidentiary value in surrounding quarries those uh, were not done by me but i have knowledge of that that is these maps were mapping coordinates were provided to you correct I do have GPS coordinates for other items. Yes, I do. All right, let's back up. Probably half of our jury knows what GPS is. The other half doesn't. That is global positioning satellite. That's correct. The other instrument uses a uh, total station also, but that also utilizes a GPS global positioning satellite system. Uh, those were specific, I believe, 11 or 12 points out in the quarries identified by the search teams. And someone else did that mapping, I understand, using a different technology. Yes, yes, sir, that is correct. Using actually satellites that have geosynchronized orbits, is that correct? Yes. To use a fancy term, that allows anybody 
who gets access to the system to know where you are by degrees of latitude and longitude down to a matter of seconds anywhere on the globe. Yes, that's correct, sir. All right. And the purpose of taking these GPS measurements was to provide them to you for your forensic mapping project? Yes. Should they become necessary later for mapping, we had it available to us if such was needed. I will show you figure 50 from your report. Okay, I will put that up here. But first, I will just ask you, this is your figure 50? Yes. That is a page of your report labelled figure 50. You have seen it before? Yes. Indeed, you made it. Is that correct? Yes, sir, I did. All right. Now, that is up on the little gizmo called an Elmo. Tell us what you see. Tell us what you have in your figure 50. This is a map, I believe, from Microsoft Streets or maybe from Delorme Atlas. I would have to see what program I used. It shows the roads in the vicinity of the Avery property, but I've I've done here, what I've done here, I indicated with a red box the approximate location of the Avery salvage, salvage yard and the approximate location of Stephen Avery's residence. There is also a reference to GPS coordinates, which I believe is for the surrounding quarry. Okay. And you put in a little red flag. Yes. What I did in this mapping program, I gave it the GPS coordinates and it gave me a little red flag. That is seen on the screen in that particular location. When using Microsoft Word, I generated my report. I labeled that flag as being those particular GPS coordinates. Okay. You gave the jury a little lesson before about degrees, minutes, and seconds. If I read the coordinates that you have given us here, or not given by you, but which were included here, we have longitudinal 44 degrees north, right? Yes. In the northern hemisphere, right? Yes. And 14 minutes, right? Yes. And 51 seconds. Yes, sir. And a latitude of 87 degrees west? Yes, sir. West of the Greenwich Mean Line? That is my understanding, sir. 41 minutes and 51 seconds? Yes, sir. Okay. And you got only one of those areas, but did I understand you that you actually were provided 11 or 12 specific GPS sites? GPS coordinates outside of the Avery Salvage Yard property. This one that you are showing is not one of the ones that was provided to me by GPS mapping team. This is one that was provided to me when I was working with Dr. Eisenberg. So I don't want any confusion or to imply or suggest that that I don't want to imply or suggest to you this is from the team that used the GPS total station. Okay, thank you. I didn't understand that. I don't want any confusion either. So this is one you got from or which Dr. Eisenberg? Or, yes. or with Dr. Eisenberg? Yes. But there were 11 or 12 other GPS coordinates. From that other team, yes. When the search teams located things they thought could be something, those were indicated to me. Something of interest? Yes. Okay. Do you have any way of knowing, as you sit here today, what the distance is from the red flag site or the site represented by the red flag here to either the salvage yard or Mr. Avery's residence? I do not, but if you would like me to, I can certainly figure it out for you. I'll bet you can.
if anything, I'll bet you can. Is that a lot of trouble? No. If you want to bring me back later, I can certainly give you that number. I don't know if I will or not. But do you have a sense at all, as of now, just ballparking? No, I don't. I wouldn't feel comfortable. Okay, fine. North is up in this figure? Yes, sir. Okay. So the flag looks like it's southwest, essentially, of the Avery Salvage property? Yes. Now, let's go back to what we are calling the three-dimensional or perspective images that give us the illusion of depth and height and width. Okay. The virtual environment of these three dimensions on those you couldn't possibly map with your total station and its prism stick every little item that a photograph might pick up, correct? No, sir. It's just a, a matter, I guess you could possibly, but there it becomes an issue of time and manpower resources, right? Yes, I agree. And how did the decision get made on what things to map and what not to map? I can give you a particular location in reference to the garage, for example. I really didn't have guidance. With the garage, I picked, or at least I wrote in my report, a page of the larger items that were there. In terms of the interior of the house, I was told main pieces of furniture, bed, dresser, desk, that type of thing. And once you have mapped them, things can be taken out, so to speak, just few out of the computer model out of the computer model. Yes. They can be hidden or as I said, turned off. So we no longer see it in that model. You gave one example of the air compressor in the garage. Do you remember that? Yes. The thing is, Mr. String. There are layers over objects, separate layers. We can essentially turn off one layer so we don't see it in our model. That was done in the garage with the air compressor, the Suzuki Samurai, and the snowmobile. Okay, now it's here, now it's not. That is a matter of a few strokes or clicks of a mouse. Yes. For you, I think I have it. Who gives you directions as to what actual items that were present should be included in the model and what are not? Guidance was given from the lead team of investigators for the prosecution. They wanted the compressor out, so you took it out? Yes. They wanted the samurai in, so you left the samurai in? Yes. Okay. Now, I will show you a photograph. I don't think that we have seen this before. I will ask if you recognize it. It's very possible that I may have taken this photograph. This appears to be the southeastern area of the salvage yard, the location where the RAV4 was located. It appears that is either in the process of covering or uncovering it, with the large blue tarp. Very good. Whether you took it or not, you recognize the photograph? Yes. There is a good old fashioned photograph. This photo? Yes. I will mark this as an exhibit. It's now exhibit 118. I would like to let the jury see it. Okay, that is the tarp over the Toyota Rev4. Yes, that is my recollection that night that the vehicle was covered. So what we are seeing under the blue tarp is the car right where it was when you arrived on November 5. Yes. And are we looking generally toward the car crusher or from the car crusher? In this position, sir, we are looking to the west. The car crusher would be off to our right and perhaps slightly behind us to the northeast. Okay, so the car crusher is back off, back off this way. If we are standing here, snapping the picture, back off behind us? No, 
it would be more to our right. If we are looking straight at that photograph as we're looking straight to the west, it's not far to the right, but slightly behind. That is the direction the crusher would be. All right. What we would see is there is a whole lot of trees, it looks like, and underbrush and that kind of thing that extends along this line of cars. Yes. There are some smaller, if you will, trees kind of along the other side of the pond. The pond would be off to our right also. Okay. We are up on a ridge, if you will, above the pond. Yes. The pond is pretty, uh, well, set down pretty low. So we're higher in elevation than the pond. There is actually sort of a berm there behind to the left of the Toyota and that line of cars. Is that correct? Yes. You can actually see that in the photograph there. I'm just pointing to the berm. Over on the opposite side of this begins some of the quarry type property. To the south of the Avery property. Yes, south would be to our left in this particular image. All right. So when, for example, you map the area around the Toyota and the car crusher in the southeastern corner of the property and created models for it, you simply omitted most or all of the trees that we see in the photographs of the area. I actually, uh, perhaps, I, I don't want to be a stickler on verbiage. I didn't create models. We have the two-dimensional orthogonal diagrams, but models usually refer to the three-dimensional model for which we use the prism of the total station to essentially trace the exterior of the tree line. So each individual tree was not collected. But we do see on the two-dimensional view just what that width, width would be as far as we can go to the trees. Okay. I think you essentially outlined the area where there would be trees. Correct. Just to better explain that, if I may, if the walls of the sides of the courtroom were the trees, I would probably take a point in the back and a point in the front just to show that this is the tree line as opposed to every individual tree. And where you did that, let's see. We are looking at one of your orthogonal views of the rare area we have been, been discussing. Yes. All right. What you have shown us in some representation of the trees to the south. Yes, that is the best way to describe the squiggly line that you just, re that you just referred to. Uh, that would have been taken along the south tree line that you're referring to now. If you look just north of that, there is another squiggly line that is tougher to see. This image right here that I'm referring to? Right. That would be the edge of the other trees there. It's very faint, but you are saying you provided some line indicating there were trees along there. Yes, it might be better if I had the color version of this. The ground, if you will, I believe is two separate colors here, which helps us to observe that difference. But that is how the mapping was done. Also, on the eastern side here, along the tree line, there is another tall berm there. But if one was standing on the crusher in the spot where the arrow comes down, you would get the impression from this orthogonal diagram, you may be able to see straight to at least the car that seems to intersect the line of sight in front of the Toyota. This would look like a line of sight on your drawing, correct? 
that was not my intention at all, Mr. String. I just wanted to show the distance from the RAV4 to the crusher. Absolutely. I understand that was not your intention. I understand. In fact, my point is that would not represent this, the line of sight, correct? No, I don't. I, I would have to go back and look at the other photographs to see how thick the tree line is. I don't want to infer that I could see the RAV4 from the crusher, which is 380 feet. There are smaller trees that you would have to look through. I just don't know. So there is no way to know because really, other than showing a squiggly line, you left out the trees and underbrush and anything else in the way. That's correct. I did. Okay. Was this the only car, if you will, on the north side of that line or near the north, the north tree line? Based on looking at the diagram, it appears that it was. I would look, I, I would like to go back and review the photographs, but I don't recall leaving out any vehicles on here that were specifically mapped. Just to point out these areas over here, these are all of the vehicles over here. Obviously, we didn't map any of those. We just traced around uh, that row of cars. But down in this area, I believe I mapped out the location of all the vehicles here, except where you see where we have this pattern again. Blank spots, so to speak. Yeah. They appear to be blank here. Again, I'm not a witness. I don't have a perfect memory. I am just. I am not just saying I think you left any cars out. I don't think you did either. But I just wondered if you had a recollection, if that was, in fact, the only car on the north side of that little lane. I can't. Uh, just looking at the drawing, I would say it was. The only car right there. Okay. I feel, I would feel more comfortable referring to some of the photographs, but I believe that is it. Mr. Butin just indicated there appears to be a second car, kind of hidden by the label of the RAV4. Yes, there is. Okay. All right. If we were going to get a real line of sight, we would really want to use photographs, not something that you and your computer generated. If we wanted to look at, at this and say, could you see the RAV4 from the crusher? No, this right now in this form is probably not the best medium to use. If you wanted to see what is the distance, that's why I had it here. As the crow flies. Right. I will not pester Mr. Cratch to go back to the PowerPoint presentation, but I will just use my black and white copy of the sheet that you folks provided me. What page are you on, sir? Uh, 27 at the bottom. Mr. Strang, just for break purposes, do you know how much time you have left? Five minutes, something like that. Mr. Kratz, what about the state? My presentation is about a minute and a half, Judge. All right, members of a jury, after we are done with this portion of the proceedings today, we are going to let you go early. That's why I kept it going. But if you want a break now, you can have a break now. No. I see heads nodding no, so we will plunge ahead. All right, Mr. Sprang. All right, our jury has already seen a slide of this, that garage, sort of, right? Yes, that's my model of the garage. And what you have done for us is help us make believe that the garage had, a, had no roof. I don't like the words make believe, but yes, the roof was removed so that we could see inside the garage. Then we can also see it as if we were hovering 20 or 30 feet up, something like that, whatever this is. Yes. 
taller than any of us. Yes. Okay. And this is pretty clean looking garage, the model. Is that correct? Yes. You have got a view of a John Deere tractor? Yes, it is. And it's a vivid electric green in colour. Is that correct? Yes. But if people look at the garage, the John Deere tractor is there. If we look at an actual picture of the garage, we see the John Deere tractor. Yes. With some other things, right? Yes. A whole lot of clutter. Yes. A snowmobile is in there. There's a table with the items in the back. I know we're seeing a lot more clutter in the actual scene or the photograph than we have seen in the model, but we have two different purposes for this too. Okay. Is this thing down here, the seat, and then the windscreen of one of the snowmobiles? Yes. Does the photograph show the garage as you actually saw it in the week of November 5 to November 12? Yes, it does. And how about this? Does that take us to the other side of the garage, the east side of the garage? Yes, that shows the east wall of the garage. We see a snowmobile, some tables. There's a freezer back over here, too. That is how I recall the garage. There is a snowmobile under there somewhere. Yeah. Do you see this green stripe here? This is the windscreen that you saw on the other side, on the other uh, one. Okay. What is the gray thing on the right side of the photo? Are you referring to this here, sir? Yes. That is the Suzuki Samurai. All right. That is a garage as it actually looked to you November 5 through November 12. Yes, that is how I recall the garage. Let's look at the south wall of the garage or part of the south wall. That is how it looked to you November 5 through November 12. Yes, it does. Again, I see a tool chest, the air compressor we talked about before. There's a weeder with a waste basket. Uh, that definitely fits my recollection of the garage. So if you use the laser pointer, the air compressor is gone? It's this green item near, it's, it's this green item down here near the center of the photo? That thing that you took out of the photo is the little evidence ten that said 23A? Yes, I did. Now, the photograph, actually, you can see pretty well under the compressor in the photograph, can't you? Yes. That is one of the few places in the garage that appears not to be cluttered. With the exception... We, we cannot see behind the wheel. I can see some flooring under it from this view. All right. I'm going to mark the photographs that you have just shown us, and then I'm done. Okay. Real quick, just so the record is clear. I'm doing them in the same order I just showed them to you. Exhibit 119 has the John Deere tractor in it. Is that correct? Yes, it does. Exhibit 120 is the side of the garage with a snowmobile that you pointed out and part of the Grey Samurai. Yes. And Exhibit 121 is the south part, the south part of the, the south wall of the garage with the air compressor. Yes, sir. Okay. I move the exhibits that have been offered with Mr. Austin, Your Honour, and that's all I have. Any objection to the exhibits? No. Very well. The exhibits are admitted. Mr. Cross. Judge, we seem destined to not have this work today. We will put it in through another witness. I will have this animation marked, however, and if it is received without objection, then I have no further questions of this witness. Thank you. Mr. Strang. That's fine. We can mark it, and I think it can be received for purposes of today. Very well. The court will order it received, but not admitted. Is that it, counsel? Yes, I think for now. 
All right, members of the jury, that is all. The jury will work we have for you today, so I am excusing you for today. Before we do that, I will remind you that the court has previously ordered that you do not watch the local news on television or listen to the local news on the radio or read the newspaper. Unless you have someone first remove any articles related to the case from the newspaper, in addition to videos, internet, websites or weblogs which include any information about the case. If you are involuntarily exposed to any information about the case from any source, please take steps to immediately avoid any further exposure. With that, you are excused for today. You may be seated. Counsel, is there anything to put on the record before we conclude today? What exhibit number did you give the animation? The animation was Exhibit 117. Judge, we did offer that, but the PowerPoint itself, although the hard copy was previously marked, I alerted the court that I was going to ask that the actual disc be received. For purposes of the record, that is Exhibit 122, and I will offer that at this time. Are there any exhibits that either party may move admission for? that we should address at this time? I have moved all of them, Judge. I think they have been authenticated and identified. I think we have addressed all of them. I know I moved exhibits 118 through 121, and those were admitted. My notes suggest that Mr. Kratz has moved his exhibits and the court has ruled on everything that he discussed or has shown today. Can I ask the clerk what exhibit 90 was? Is this on the record? I don't know who is speaking right now. That's Mr. Fallon. Okay, thank you. Mr. Austin's report is Exhibit 90, and the PowerPoint is Exhibit 122. Okay. Mr. Kratz, has the state moved admission of the animation disc? Yes. I think that was viewed <coughs> in the motion hearing before we started. Does the defense agree? that it can be admitted. That was the thing they didn't get to work today, but I believe it previously had been shown in court as part of our motion hearing. Right. That is, that is Exhibit 117. It was offered and received. I don't think that it was admitted yet because nobody identified it or has seen it. Isn't that Exhibit 117? Yes. I take it authentication is not going to be a problem so it will be admitted when it is viewed in front of the jury. Right. All right, very well. Anything else today? If not, I would like to see the council for just a couple of minutes in chambers before you leave.